Okay. One fifty six. Okay, looks like we're holding there around with the people coming in. Um, so I will get started here to be mindful of everyone's time. Let everyone know I'm going to start recording. Okay. Looks like that is going. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's policy workgroup meeting to discuss updates on the heavy duty vehicles and equipment. My name is Yang Trin, and I'll be the moderator today to lead you through our heavy, uh, pun intended, agenda. Next slide. Okay, uh, a little bit about my background before we get started. I am the new manager overseeing HVIP and core incentive funding projects. I'm just about to hit my um, 25th year of silver service with about 20 years of those at CARB. I previously worked on the car Moyer program, uh, but also uh, have worked on regulations. I spent a significant number of years conducting investigations and enforcement work. And if somehow our paths cross previously, somehow in that arena, uh, I guess you could say I've come full circle with issuing vouchers in HVIP and CORE uh, versus imposing fines and settlement agreements. So, okay. On to the agenda. So we value your time and I wanna hit some key points about the purpose of today's meeting. Uh, CARB staff will be sharing updates on each of the respective topic sessions. Each lead staff will also be sharing fun, uh, initial thoughts as we develop policies for the fiscal year 24-25 funding plan for clean transportation incentives. So this meeting is an opportunity to provide input to CARB staff to define proposed policy changes new implementation mechanisms, and eligibility criteria for the upcoming funding year. CARB staff will aggregate, evaluate, and incorporate input gathered during the public process and present the proposals to the board in November of this year. So before we start, here's some information on workgroup logistics. Today's workgroup is being recorded, as I mentioned, and a copy of the recording and list of participants will be posted on CARB's low transportation, well, sorry, low carbon transportation webpage within the next two weeks. Uh, today's work group is intended to be a conversation throughout the afternoon. We will pause for questions and comments after staff finishes their respective presentations. We will ask that you raise your hand to let us know um, that you'd like to ask a question or comment. And then CARB staff will um, unmute your line. For those participating via phone, please press number two uh, to raise your hand and we'll remind you of uh, those instructions throughout the work group. As always, we appreciate your patience in case we encounter any technical uh, glitches. Uh, and lastly, we are unable to allow anonymous meeting participants for security reasons. Please make sure your name is clear on the Zoom platform. Uh, if you've called in, we'll raise, um, raise your hand and we'll identify you by the last four digits of your number. Um, my contact information is posted on some of the end of some of the slides for HVIP and CORE, um, but as the contacts for each project lead uh, will also be there. So if you have additional questions and comments after this meeting, you're welcome to contact us via email and we'll get back to you to follow up. Okay, next slide. So that was the... Um, uh, overview, and I will now turn it over to uh, Indra Atwal. He can uh, go over HVIP. Uh, thanks, Young. Um, my name is Indra Atwal. I am the policy lead for HVIP. Um, and so for folks that haven't uh, heard from me before, um, I have recently taken over. Uh, it's been almost a year, but so if we can go to the next slide and then I can jump into the presentation. Um, as HVIP enters its 14th year, the project continues to adapt to changing needs. This year, HVIP continues to strengthen its focus on supporting underserved fleets and more targeted measures to address air quality needs in California's priority populations. 
As you can see here, HBIP is focused on supporting CARB regulatory programs, accelerating market transformations to the cleanest technologies, and supporting equitable investments. And these are our principles that we've laid out for several years now. Uh, next slide. As of July 2024, HIP had nearly 165 million in available funds. And currently, as of uh, 8 5 2024, HIP has 149 million available. Um, over the program's life, uh, over 12,000 vehicles have been funded, with almost 2,000 fleets uh, participating in the program. As there will be no additional funding allocations to HIP proposed in the funding year 2024 2025, Due to the limited funding available in the budget and the needs in other project categories, HBIT funds are on pace to be exhausted by late 2024, early 2025. Um, this year, we are proposing the following changes to HBIT to strengthen its focus on supporting underserved fleets and ensuring support of the market transformation to the cleanest technologies. Um, as you can see here, uh, we've got three proposals. Um, one proposal that isn't mentioned, but uh, just of note, um, we in previous years, the fleet size limits were proposed um, as approved in the funding year 2023-2024 funding plan. Private fleets with 50 medium and heavy duty vehicles or more would no longer be eligible for HVIP. This provision will, will take effect in, on January 1st, 2025, as proposed in previous funding plans. Um, specifically for this year's uh, funding cycle, what we're looking for comment on is really uh, three new proposals um, that revolve around uh, voucher amounts. As the marketplace for ZEV trucks is constantly changing, CARB must reevaluate voucher amounts across vehicle classes to ensure that they are funded within the guiding principles of HVIP. And so CARB will review the voucher amounts for class 2B through 8 vehicles about current condition marking conditions, make changes to these vouchers, and place voucher limit caps to ensure that the vouchers reflect the program's intent. So we're looking at uh, a holistic approach, looking at all the voucher amounts that we're currently proposing and seeing if they make sense in the current market uh, place. In addition, changes may include the inter introduction of an MSRP cap with a glide down of the pr price cap starting in 2026. In addition, we will be evaluating the full suite of plus ups and voucher adjustments based on fleet size to limit, simplify the program. Uh, previously with the different types of fleets being available, being eligible for HVIP funding. We had several plus ups for small businesses and uh, other uh, different categories. As we are now kind of allowing that fleet size limit to take effect January 1st, we'll be looking at simplifying the whole voucher system um, to kind of better reflect the principles of HVIP and just make this the voucher process a little bit simpler. In addition, we are um, exploring the issuance of vehicle vouchers, and this is early in the development phase, but the idea being here, CARB would explore a potential revamp of the voucher process, whereby fleets would be given a voucher redemption certificate that they could then use to shop for a vehicle that meets their needs, and essentially get like a preliminary approval for an HVIP voucher, and then be able to get a list of potential um, dealers that they could go to to purchase a vehicle and negotiate a price. And so those are the kind of things that we're thinking about and looking for comment from the public on in terms of uh, new policies. I think that would be my last slide, but you can go to the next slide. if it, um, Just here's a contact information. And then at this time, we can open it up for any comments or questions on HVIP uh, before we move on to the next topic. Yeah, so just, uh, just a reminder, we'll be using the uh, raised hand feature. Uh, if you have a question or comment, I will uh, call on people as they come in. Uh, when I call on your name, I'll unmute your microphone. Please make sure to state your name and affiliation before uh, making your comment or asking your question. Uh, Andrew, I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone. You'll probably have to unmute on your end, too. There you go. Yeah, great. Can you hear me okay? We can. All right, yeah, there's Andy Schwartz of Tesla. Um, a couple questions. Um, first, um, I didn't have a chance to look at the documents that have been posted, but is there kind of more detail on the, each of the staff proposals that have been identified? The, well, currently, there is, and we're really in the early phases of developing these policies. And so, um, you know, we're soliciting comment, and then we will have more documents 
more flesh on the meat uh, for these policies as we get closer to the funding plan uh, release. Okay. Um, and then uh, related to, uh, or um, my second question, um, I believe in one of the prior working group sessions, there was discussion about uh, the expected implementation of a demonstration, a demonstration sort of vehicle voucher that would be available for demo vehicles. And I was curious if there's any update on the status of that. Yeah, we are currently, we've, we've gone ahead and um, produ produced the policy documents and we're actually in legal review at this point. And so it should, as soon as that review is completed, we will be releasing those documents on the policies and procedures for that. So we're just waiting for an update on that. Okay, and is there sort of a, a rough timeline for when you expect those to be released? And it should be time uh, soon. Um, I, I can't really, you know, I don't think it would be more than a month, but you know, it would be pretty soon. We're in the final final plan, black of so that effort. So great. And then I guess last question while I have the mic: um, Is there any additional information that's been released on the, I guess, program participation? In particular, looking for information on sort of the total number of vouchers that have been issued sort of by fleet size and how that's been changing over time in light of the different policies that um, CARB has implemented over the past several years? Yeah, so there is, um, so the California HPIP has the um, dashboard, uh, the voucher map dashboard that's available on the website. And there, sh there should be on there as well as some Excel information, um, like a document of all the fleet information as well. And different ways to sort that and you can download CSVs of the number of vouchers over time and so forth. Um, if there's something that's a little more detailed, you can definitely reach out to me and then I can kind of help you see if we can, if it's up there, if it's not, we can get it to you. Okay. Yeah. I just wasn't sure if that data was um, sort of tabulated by fleet size or not, but um, yeah, I can take a look and follow up accordingly. Thanks. No problem. All right, Eric, I think next one. Got a couple, right? Sorry to remove his ability to talk. Our next uh, comment or question is going to come from Kristen. Kristen, I'm going to go, Corby, I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Christian Corby, and I'm the deputy director at the California Electric Transportation Coalition, or Cal ATC. Uh, so thank you for uh, for having this meeting today. Definitely appreciate an opportunity to discuss discuss HVIP. It's a really critical program for uh, transitioning the state's fleet uh, to zero emission. Um, so we would definitely support simplifying the voucher process. Uh, we've heard uh, from fleets and uh, from dealers that the the process can be kind of slow and uh, perhaps a little cumbersome. So. Uh, would would definitely support things to simplify the process. I would also recommend talking to the medium and heavy duty truck dealers in the state uh, to kind of hear what they would recommend. Um, I know some of them can be pretty over leveraged uh, when they're ordering expensive medium and heavy duty trucks um, um, and still waiting for the voucher funding to come through. Um, so definitely support that. Uh, also, uh, would support uh, uh, Tesla's comments about uh, having more info on the participants by fleet size. The the website is is great. You can you can definitely pull down a lot of good information there. I think the only fleet specific piece on there though for sizing is the just the small fleet. So I think it's twenty or less. Um, but it'd be interesting to kind of see some of the other uh, fleet sizes as well to see uh, who's all participating. Um, so yeah, definitely. Uh, Definitely support uh, continuing working with CARB on on HVIP. It's a it's a critical program. I, I also wanted to ask if CARB was considering uh, extending that fifty vehicle restriction for another year. Uh, I know you know we were definitely supportive of extending that uh, and allowing uh, larger fleets. I mean, fifty vehicles is not a large fleet necessarily, but just allowing fleets that are subject to the ACF rule. To still be able to access uh, HVIP uh, in certain instances, a lot of those fleets, even though yes, they're they are regulated by ACF, they are they are definitely going to need assistance in transitioning uh, to these uh, more expensive vehicles and installing infrastructure and dedicating uh, resources internally to uh, to sorting sorting out that transition. So 
uh, would support any feedback that you have on considering that uh, an extension for another year. Yeah, sure. To that point, um, I think not at this time. We're not really looking to extend that. Um, you know, I think the budget constraints are kind of pretty pretty clearly been stated previously. But we are definitely open to comments, and if if the environment changes, definitely open to making a change. But right right now, as of today's conditions, not not really looking at extending that deadline. Okay. Thank you for your consideration, though. Mm -hmm. Okay, our next uh, comment or question is going to come from Lynette. Lynette, I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation. Thank you. This is Lynette Sapienza with the Dome Partnership. I had a few questions on the HFIP. Um, the first one being, based on the small fleet needs and a number of these um, businesses with limited capital, and those size of businesses, um, you know, the key to addressing some equity issues with them is in their areas is kind of getting into smaller vehicles. Um, the light trucks are tend, you know, tend to be operated more by um, these small to medium sized businesses. Is the program going to be considering expanding the HVIB to include pickup trucks at all in the future? So we uh, HVIP is really designed for commercial vehicles, um, light duty uh, vehicles in general, and I think some of the lighter duty pickup trucks fall into that category are really handled under the that program, the light duty sector. Um, our program has been traditionally HVIP from its initial beginnings has always been really focused on commercial delivery vans uh, and commercial applications, um, and so so that's been really our focus. Um, it, throughout the years. And so I don't see at this point that changing. Um, you know, I, I know that we've got, so we do fund vehicles from 2B all the way to 8. Um, and so some of those smaller, uh, you know, delivery type vehicles that are commercially designed, designed for commercial applications have been included in our program um, from various manufacturers. But I don't think we would be opening it up to uh, just uh, like class. I, you know, the lower class, lower weight classes for just normal pickup trucks. All right. So you don't anticipate the class of vehicles changing in this program then? No. And and I don't think that um, necessarily the incentives and the market structures and, you know, would really, you know, the money that would, would be given in a voucher necessarily probably wouldn't be a, a driving point for a lot of those vehicles. And really, our, it would require a revamp of our, what HRIP was intended for. HRIP is really intended for commercial vehicle applications. Okay. Um, and then as you're looking at the program, um, are there going to be any special considerations or clarifications um, in this update for trucks as a service providers? Um, no, I don't anticipate that. I think a lot of those policy things, the decisions have been made um, and are included in the implementation manual. Um, at this point, we're really focusing on kind of vouchers and voucher amounts and voucher structure um, this policy cycle. And that's uh, trucks as a service kind of tend to be under ISA um, more than uh, HF standard. So. Okay. Um, our next uh, comment or question is going to come from Lisa McGee. Lisa, please unmute your microphone and state your affiliation. Hi, uh, yeah. I'm Lisa McGee with Tom's Truck Center. And to address some of the opportunities that we're seeing um, in the revamping and the feedback that you're looking for, you know, you talk about revamping the voucher issue process. We would also like to see a revamp of the voucher redemption process. That has been a really big pain point um, for dealers. And we're a fairly, I'd probably say medium to, probably a medium, maybe slightly large dealer. Um, but, you know, I think what it's doing is it's excluding small dealers to participate. Um, you know, when you get upwards of several million dollars with just, um, for example, 10 trucks is, hypothetically, maybe up to almost $4 million worth of rebates. And 
if you're going to be a dealer that's going to continuously month over month um, have your pipeline that you're trying to deliver on is creates its own set of issues that we don't, don't have a line of credit from CARB um, to support those types of redemption process timelines. And while we've tried to dig in that a little bit, I think there's opportunity for more solutions by accelerating the funding. It's just not, it just doesn't meet a requirement for a business use case um, with that much risk. Um, we're already, we're already delivering trucks, but those trucks might take three or four months to get paid on. And we've got interest. It's just, it's creating a lot of issues and risk for us, um, not only financially, but also on the on the actual title and collateral of that vehicle, not even in our name anymore. Um, so I'd like to see the re a revamp of the, of the voucher. I think the stakeholders are the dealers that um, are the ones that are actually spending um, time with experience in this, in this, they're a stakeholder with true experience in the process, in your process. So I think I, I, could, I would consider that to be my number one objective um, and then focusing on how independent owner operators need to be better supported by the process for vouchers. And if you go into a more simplified process, we just need to make sure that there's a good, a good definition and understanding of the, of the operational um, the operational model for those independent operators. Um, we're getting pushback and rejections on parking agreements. These guys don't have a commercial agreement um, with the facility, they're just simply renting a parking space, which means they can't produce a three month, um, yet alone a one year or yet alone a three year parking agreement in some cases. And they also can't support providing a utility agreement um, because they don't have the relationship um, in the commercial agreement for the responsibility to that utility. So those are, I think to me, easy fixes because as long as they can be approved that they're a compliant, true independent operator, then I think I think it's a moot point. So I'd like to see a revamp of how independent owner operators are better treated in this process of voucher requests, because it's, it's very painful to watch these guys um, be lost. Um, and on, um, I think a lot of that could help simplify the process um, if we get dealer stakeholder engagement um, whether you guys provide a quarterly process that's a, really a committee that stays in play always and ever because there is no feedback or forum outside of something like this to really dig into a little bit more of the weeds and put some great minds together with experience to help find that simplicity. Um, and my last one on the MSRP cap, um, can you expand on what your thinking is on that for me? Yeah, I think um, in terms of the amounts of vouchers, so we have really the idea is to kind of look at some market data um, we're doing right now. We're undergoing a process of looking at costs of vehicles across different markets, all the way from 2B through class A and really understanding where electric vehicle of well, ZAP vehicles are pricing out in the marketplace and trying to get a better understanding of how our vouchers are fitting into that. And so from there, we're kind of looking to see if we're funding at adequate levels for, you know, class eights, or are we funding too much for certain uh, level, certain vehicle types? And so I'm just kind of going through the whole uh, okay. again and, and looking at where our vouchers are and, you know, how much are they at. And so, um, so that, you know, that's, that's where a potential MSRP cap could come into play. Um, looking at, you know, currently we're doing like a double up for a small business, uh, small business fleets right and so when we're 50 and below probably doesn't make so much sense um probably better off having a voucher amount that reflects more of the price and what what the incremental difference is between uh, a, a Z vehicle and a diesel vehicle so that kind of analysis is what we're undergoing right now and from exactly. there we'll, we'll do a revamp of the whole vouchers uh okay so i guess vehicle, so. okay that's helpful so i would say my comment to that point would just be oh. is that don't forget we've got, you know, many of these trucks are, if they're a class eight, they're a tractor, right? So if they get additional builds on that, that would change the price point. Um, and then model years change the price point. Um, and the medium duty sector, you've got a build that still has to be established and that build can completely change the price point. So I want to make sure when you guys are collecting your data and determining what it should be, I'd like to see that go back out to the stakeholders um, and the dealers 
um, to get their feedback on that when you guys start kind of implementing um, a baseline of what you see for each of those GBWRs is what I'm assuming you're going to do. Yeah. Um, so I, um, just to, on that note, uh, just before, um, just to kind of give you a little more context of the process. So uh, part of the, you know, this process will be getting um, input today and then we'll be releasing a draft plan um, prior to the proposed actual funding plan. So, so there'll be multiple um, opportunities to actually uh, kind of get a better idea of what, what the final decisions are going to be. So. Okay. All right. I've got two comments. Um, dealer demos. Um, you guys have been advertising that since quarter four, 2023, yet it's still not available. Um, so I would like to see a better process when it comes to what you're trying to do as a solution, but not, it just seems to be go, it just seems to go dark, but yet it's still there. Um, and then to be more timely with outputting on the manual, it's constantly being referred to. So to, so to make it easier on our lives, um, it's constantly referred to as a um, as a tool that we obviously rely on. But um, some of the feedback that we're getting from staff, whether it be through your your Tetra Tech team or the CalStart team, is we're often just given sometimes a link as an answer. And sometimes the link doesn't provide the answer. But I think when you've got a lot of experience in the industry, it kind of shows you that we're drawing upon questions and trying to interpret information that's written and sometimes these things deserve a conversation. So I'm not sure. I think there's a way to improve that because it's sometimes it's just at a standstill and super frustrating and emails just go on way too long unnecessarily. So, so I'd like to see the, the manual um, developed and, and, and timely year over year developed and, and published. And I'd like to make sure that we've got a better system instead of links and everything that, that maybe just get published in multiple places, but some are old and we're just not getting the support that we need, but that would be it. Thank you for this meeting. I think it's really necessary. I'm glad to hear that you guys are open-minded to some new policy changes. Thank you. Okay, our next uh, comment or question is going to come from Terry. Terry, I'm going to unmute your mic. Before I do, though, I just want to let people know, as you come in, you come in on a list. So if you uh, drop off and then come back in, you go to the bottom of the list. So if you've if your question's been answered and then you have a new question, by all means, but resetting your hand is just moving you further back down in the in the list. So with that, Terry, I'm going to unmute your microphone. Okay. Can you hear me? We can. Awesome. Thank you. My name is Terry Mannies. I am with Orange EV. I am the manager of grants and strategic initiatives. Super quick question. If it's possible that we are going to run out of money, uh, the vouchers may be gone by late 2024. Do we have any idea when the program would be refunded? I don't mean refunded, but I mean funded again. So, you know, a lot of that is an uncertain uh, path forward, right? Uh, budgets, con constraints, and all the other bits that kind of affect everything. Um, we are looking at developing a process for uh, contingency lists. Um, you know, even if voucher money gets exhausted, uh, sometimes vouchers don't get redeemed and money comes back into the pot. And so we'll be kind of working through that process. And then as soon as we get, you know, more, uh, more of an idea of what money would be available in future budget years, we'll definitely be having more of these public processes to kind of give people insight onto that. So, but it is going to be an evolving future. Um, so hard to predict at this point, though. Fair enough. Thank you very much. Our next uh, comment or question is going to come from Jamie. Jamie, I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation. Great. Uh, thanks very much. Jamie Levin with the Center for Transportation and the Environment. I know later this afternoon you're going, we're going to get into more discussions about the heavy duty voucher program, but I wanted to uh, not so much pose a question, but, but, but raise the dilemma that we're all looking at. And we work in uh, deploying uh, transit buses and class eight trucks. Um, you still hear me? I can. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you. So, so the dilemma is this: uh, you spoke to the fact that your, you know, the available funds are now down to around 140 million dollars. The VW uh, funds are already fully allocated. Uh, we're looking at just the trucking industry: a secondhand diesel trucks, which are not allowed uh, to be, you know, to enter ports, but still 
the 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 secondhand market is forty two thousand dollars for a class eight day cab. Uh, we're you know the zero emission uh, options are ten times or more than that. Uh, transit bus uh, uh, costs are well over a million dollars, upwards of a million and a half for a fuel cell. And quite honestly, your voucher program, and it's not your, the legislature's got to step in uh, on this because we have an advanced clean fleet and an innovative clean transit rule. And you just don't offer enough money to make the kind of dent that has to be made if we're really going to meet our, uh, our, uh, green, uh, you know, our uh, greenhouse gas reduction goals. So I pose this because with the little money that you've got, I would like you to consider how best to use that without spreading it so thinly that it really doesn't make a difference at the end of the day for the fleet operators, whether they're transit agencies or truck fleets. Thank you. Um, so just, just real quick on a point. Um, so yeah, I, I, I do take on board your issue with all the funding running out and you know i think some of those concerns are pretty clear to the public but uh as far as uh vw i'd like to hand it over to april to kind of speak to some of the vw funds since that was mentioned in a couple of those comments hi jamie i just wanted to clarify that uh while the vw bus money may be oversubscribed right now there is still money available for class eight zero emission trucks through the South Coast Air District. Right. No, I, I appreciate that. But I will make the point again that uh, if a transit bus is going for well over a million, and in some cases, well, in the case of fuel cell applications, and there, we're working with a lot of transit agencies that are moving in the direction of fuel cell, those right now are selling for well over one and a half million dollars. So if you don't have VW money and you look at the max uh, with all the plus ups for uh, for uh, transit, it's around 250 thereabouts, plus or minus. It's just not enough. They can't afford to make the kinds of uh, procurements that they are going to need to under the ICT. And for truckers, fleet operators, like I said, a secondhand drayage day cab. Look at the uh, look at the uh, market uh, price sheets. Goes for around forty three thousand dollars. Now they cannot be used under the new ACF ACF after January one. Although that's subject to lawsuits and EPA. But my point is, we've got to figure out, and it's not just on carb. It really is on the legislature, but CARB staff needs to think about this. How are we going to make a difference in deploying not tens and hundreds, but thousands? Because that is what we have to do, uh, is to, to deploy thousands of transit buses and many thousands of, of trucks operating in and out of the ports. And I think that's a fair point, but um, I would also emphasize there are, are other monies available, funding sources from federal funds as well, um, and CalSTA, and so, and I know there's a couple of folks that can speak to that a little bit, but we do take your comments on board and understand the challenges in the marketplace. And, and just so you know, Ender, we, we, we have gone after those grants successfully. There's FTA low-no grants on the transit side. We're going after DOE funding. Uh, the hydrogen hub has come through. We're part of that. It's still a big dilemma. A uh, billion dollars out of the hydrogen hub for fuel cell programs and the like uh, is, is a lot, and it's not a lot. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Appreciate that. Thank you. Next uh, comment or question is going to come from James. James, I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is James Howe. I'm with Odine Systems. Uh, very quick question, uh, kind of based on the constraints um, that we're all seeing and recognizing. What is the impact on the HFIP voucher program for EPTO side? 
I'm sorry, uh, it broke up on my end again. What was that? Can you repeat that? Yes, yeah, so I wanted to see what the impact uh, to the EPTO voucher vouchers within HVIP will be. So at this point, I, I couldn't speak to that in particular, um, but I can kind of give you an idea of the methodology we're going to be using. Um, so really, we'll be looking at our our information that we've collected over the years on MSRP costs of the, these vehicles. So like the EPTO vehicles would be one of them, just like class eight tractors would be another. Um, and we'd be looking at that, uh, what the average costs are, what the marketplace is doing and seeing how our vouchers are in there and then look at diesel prices as a comparison, right? And so that would be the kind of the general um, way we would be going about this. Um, you know, I think from a perspective, EPTO vehicles have an increased cost over a straight vehicle, right? Um, for obvious right. reasons. Yeah. And so, so I think that, you know, the way to think about this is we would be looking at each vehicle type, just like each vehicle type gets a different voucher amount. So I think that would be a, one of the considerations. So it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a blanket change for class, regardless of if it ever had an EPTO or not. So. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. And our next uh, question or comment is going to come from uh, Andrew. Andrew, I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation. Hi, Andrew Pontius here with uh, Ev Electric uh, in Compton. And um, we're a well, retrofit or repower company. So our kits allow medium duty trucks to become fully electric. And so the question that I have really pertains to both HVIP and ISEF. And it's about the amount of the vouchers and the fact that with a retrofit, we really have a nice price advantage at MSRP versus brand new, but with the half off voucher that gets kind of wiped out and it makes us uncompetitive against new when the voucher is half as much for ours versus the new. So we're trying to find a path uh, and we're trying, we're talking to anybody who will listen within uh, CARB and, and CalSTART about uh, the path to equity for these repower kits. Uh, so that we can get the same voucher amount as the new. Is there anything in the works already to bring equity to that? Or can you help me with insight on the path that we should be taking to get that equity? So I, I think that, um, you know, some of those policy decisions were in previous funding uh, cycles. At this point, we are open to listening to comments and having discussions with folks, but we really haven't considered uh, changing previous policy decisions on that front. Um, but, you know, I would encourage you to reach out to uh, Young and RI and then we can kind of speak to you and s s get some more information from you on, on your guys' stance in that regard and um, kind of go from there. Young, did you want to chime in? Hey, sorry, this was Evo Electric, was that yeah. right? Yep, that's us. Yes, yeah, hey Andrew. Yeah, I received um, your email. So um, we're gonna be reaching out shortly so we can have a follow-up discussion. Awesome, looking forward to the dialogue. Uh, we're excited to uh, to try to bring some equity to that situation. Great. Thanks guys. Okay, our next uh, comment or question is gonna come from Michael. Michael, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation. You're still there you go all right so folks uh good to be with you this afternoon uh michael pimentel i'm the executive director of the california transit association uh, we represent 220 member organizations across california's transit industry that includes 85 transit and rail agency members uh, i want to uh, redouble on a uh, part of the message that was delivered uh, by jamie levin of cte uh, specifically as it relates to hfip vouchers for transit. Uh, one of the things that we've seen uh, coming out of the pandemic uh, is a fairly significant increase in the cost of zero emission transit buses. And one of the things that unfortunately we have not seen uh, is HFIP vouchers increase uh, to help uh, defray uh, some of those higher costs that are being experienced by the transit agencies. Uh, now, having worked with, with CARB and CARB staff uh, over the many years, uh, on the development of the HFIP program have always understood that HFIP is intended to offset a portion of the incremental cost of getting to fully uh, zero emission uh, transition. 
Uh, but unfortunately, what we're seeing is that the purchasing power of those HF uh, dollars has been decreasing pretty steadily over time. And so to Jamie's broader observation around uh, the need for there to be some progress uh, in this area, we really do need to see those HF vouchers uh, increase to incite more agencies to move forward with these ZEB transitions. Uh, of course, the dynamic that's before us on the VW mitigation, the uh, oversubscription there, uh, creates some um, downward pressure on, on agencies being able to move forward with zero emission transition. Uh, would not suggest in, in this forum that uh, HFIP has to uh, come up to exactly the levels of VW or necessarily uh, to cover the full incremental cost, uh, but we ought to see some form of increase uh, to allow for agencies to make the right decisions uh, as they're doing procurements and to move forward with a zero emission pathway. Uh, and so uh, we, we will formalize our comments uh, in, uh, in written form. Uh, we'll provide some additional uh, comments uh, as it relates to HFIP policy. Uh, but today I did feel that it was important for us to participate to speak to uh, our interest in a higher voucher amount uh, as we build out the program for next year. You know, I had just one follow up kind of question and, um, you know, Michael, please feel free to, you know, we can discuss this after, but I think one of our concerns when we kind of weigh these voucher amounts is that we set them at a level that adequately supports the marketplace, but also the, when, whenever we increase a voucher amount, we're going to get to a place where we're going to fund fewer vehicles. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's always a challenge for us when we come up with these um, voucher amounts, right? We want to support enough but maybe not so much that we don't we can't fund as many vehicles as we we would ideally like to right um and so that that's kind of always a challenge in the back of our heads especially in a budget constrained environment as we're entering into this year at yes least. certainly a consideration that that we've discussed within my association i'll say you know despite that that discussion you know the preponderance of my members have expressed the, the interest in seeing those voucher amounts uh, increase, even though it'll mean uh, fewer fewer buses uh, get funded. And I think a lot of the reason for that is particularly in this fiscally constrained uh, situation that most agencies find themselves in post-pandemic. Uh, in the absence of higher voucher amounts, we may just see agencies who are leaving money on the table uh, because the, the voucher amounts aren't sufficient enough to actually incite the, the migration to these technologies. Uh, and that, you know, is, is acute in a lot of uh, the, the urban areas where we've seen uh, ridership recovery lag and, and therefore revenue uh, recovery lag, but also, too, for many of the, the small and rural agencies uh, who have historically been uh, fairly challenged to fund the transition outright. Um, you know, the, the higher purchasing costs is really having a chilling effect on their ability to really even contemplate uh, the transition. And so, um, you know, the, the higher voucher amount may, may get uh, quicker uptake. Uh, and while I wouldn't stipulate this is a, the sole reason for a slower drawdown on uh, the HFIP transit, there's probably an extent to which some of the slower uptake in, in the drawdown, uh, the fact that we have capacity in that program uh, standing over multiple years, uh, is reflection of agencies not seeing um, the, the voucher amounts set at a level that really incites that, that, that change to the, the cleaner technologies. Well, thanks again, Michael. We'll definitely take that on board. Thank you. Our next uh, comment or question is going to come from Joshua. Joshua, I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation. Hello there. Can you hear me? We can. All right. This is Josh Vidic from Hyundai. Um, just wanted to take a quick second to reaffirm some comments that we've provided previously regarding the application for hydrogen on our class eight trucks um just asking for some consideration or re-examination of possibly having some separate um guidelines and requirements for hydrogen versus bev um, especially when it comes to the fleet cap size um, given the nascency of this industry and technology you know they come with high price tags and then with the infrastructure challenges um you know, a lot of the times we're only able to kind of start working with very, very large fleets that can help, you know, make investment into infrastructure in addition to investment into the actual 
you know, purchase of the product. So in order to kind of move this, you know, nascent technology into something more mainstream, you know, we kind of require and depend on the big pocketbooks and high solvency of these larger corporations and fleets uh, to be able to make some of these investments um, to help the initiative. And so when we apply that that fleet cap in the hydrogen space, it it really kind of makes it a uphill battle because, you know, the smaller fleets aren't, aren't necessarily able to make as strong of investment into infrastructure. Um, so it, it kind of just puts it puts the initiative at a halt pretty quickly. And so I'm just, again, taking the chance here to kind of reaffirm we've made this comment prior um, and just appreciate, you know, any reexamination or, you know, consideration into that uh, as we do think that that has a big impact on the success of this program, which uh, we, we love dearly and want to see it continue and help us. Um, so we're just doing our part to provide feedback and hopefully it's considered. Yeah. Just to that point, um, Josh, we are, so the fleet size cap is going to um, end for, start essentially in January 1st, 2025. But as mentioned in previous funding plans, public entities, California Native American tribes and nonprofit organizations will not be subject to the cap. And additionally, ent entities purchasing new to market technologies such as fuel cell vehicles would not be subject until the technology received achieved a higher degree of market penetration. So I think that would probably be in line with um, keeping fuel cells vehicles like you're mentioning here still available to 50 or more. Do you mind restating that list of uh, groups or if there's somewhere I can easily find that online, I can do that as well. Yeah, I can. Um, yeah, well, I can state it for you again here or I can just email you if you, if you prefer. Uh, Whatever's you easiest. To. Yeah. Um, yeah, just shoot me an email directly and I, I can send you that language so you have it. Okay, can do. Thank you very much. And then just a quick follow up question um, regarding the process. Um, I'm kind of new to the the hydrogen team here, so I'm still learning, you know, a little bit. But any any info or data, I guess, on the redemption process? Um, I'm kind of most curious just about time between when a voucher is applied for versus when it's actually re redeemed. Do we have like an average amount of time that that takes? Um, and again, if that's available online somewhere and I just haven't seen it, my apologies in advance. Yeah, I don't believe it is available online, um, but, you know, it, it does vary, you know, depending on whether the application is complete or incomplete and, and all of that. But if if you reach out to me, we can, we can, I can get you some more information. On okay, that. perfect. Thank you very much. Hey, our next uh, comment or question is going to come from uh, Nihau. I apologize if I mispronounce that. I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation. Good afternoon. This is Naui Olin from with Nicola Corporation. And my comment relates to kind of some of the comments that both the gentleman from Tesla mentioned. I also fully support the comments by Lisa McGee from Tomstruck Center. And also tying it back to just the comments recently by the gentleman from Hyundai. I know funding is running, running low, like you mentioned, but what I'm Questioning is, as you mentioned, I think earlier on that there will be a review of voucher amounts and the plus ups, but I think that's for fiscal year 24, 25. Now, since the funding is being depleted either by late this year or, or early next year, I guess my question is, will there be any review or potential to review these voucher amounts or plus ups so that the money can last a little longer? And what I'm really trying to get to is, this is kind of test back to the comments by Hyundai, in that, for example, in class A trucks, small fleets, which I'm all for, for supporting, you know, voucher amounts are super generous right now. But the problem with that is, like Hyundai said, you know, smaller fleets don't have the big pockets to support the infrastructure required to adapt the technology. So at least what I think is, you know, there could be a lot of, uh, there's a lot of opportunity where fleets that want to adopt the technology, like the larger, th that have the money to, to implement the technology and infrastructure, are now being left out from the program, while at the same time, there can be a lot of options where there's a lot of money or a lot of funding made available to a particular vehicle, or maybe that can be revisited to make it, to, to spread the money a little more evenly. Yeah, I, I think that this would, you know, just along the lines of our public process that you're correct, like this will be for following this year's funding cycle. But I mean, I think that that's a necessity of the timelines here. And the analysis that would need to be done to to do this, and additionally with the public process. So I think 
all, for all those reasons, we we really wouldn't be able to bring this forward um, to funding that's been going out that's going out this year um, that's already in the pipeline. But I think you know our interest is to take a look at all of the different classes of vehicles, really do a thorough analysis, and come up with voucher amounts that make the most sense for the marketplace. I guess one final uh, question too. I remember in previous meetings there had been mentioned about possibility of establishing a voucher a process for used vehicles. I didn't see that in this slide. Is there still that in the works potentially or not anymore? For used vehicles, I don't think that would be under uh, ICIF standard. Um, I, I mean, HVIP standard. I think ICIF had some thought to that. But again, I think um, you know that was more of a study um, potentially you know, being something that was explored as opposed to being presented today. So, but, but it, I, that wouldn't be ready for a trip standard. So. Um, just a quick time check. We, we got uh, seven minutes. We got to wrap this up at two 30. I have, we got a hard stop to move on to the next uh, uh, group. I got four hands up. We will do our best to get through everybody, uh, but please try to make your, uh, um, your your comments and questions concise if you could. Uh, with that, I'm going to unmute Robert's microphone. Please state your name and affiliation. Oh, looks like Robert just put his hand down. Uh, I will unmute uh, Jackson. Please uh, state your name and affiliation. To unmute on your end too, Jackson. Jackson Alvarez. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and move along. Uh, next uh, comment or question is going to come from Mark Roast. Mark Roast, I'm going to unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation. Hello, my name is Mark Roost. I'm with Sustainable Energy, Inc., and I'm also an advisor to Silicon Valley Clean Cities Coalition. Low volume conversions um, cost $150,000 or more, but high for bigger vehicles, but high volume with current battery technology, maybe 80,000 to 100,000. And with the batteries we're developing, maybe 60,000 plus any required refurbishment. These batteries would qualify for IRA. This means supporting conversions at their current cost now can rapidly lead to slashing the cost per unit and enabling decarbonizing to go faster than new vehicle production. Okay, so uh, and in terms of the of the re the infrastructure, um, the new solar that's going to be coming out will be able if you put it on the roof. Uh, you'll get two or three times more electricity than you will out of current solar. And you can also put it on canopies or parking and driveways. So the even medium and large fleets could power the entire fleet and the building with solar canopies and stationary battery storage so that you wouldn't have to wait seven years, for example, for the Port of Oakland for them to expand the trunks leading into the Port plus West Oakland combination which is almost saturated in terms of load already. All right, thank you so much for your comment. We'll definitely take that into consideration. Yeah, I would... Our next uh, comment or question is gonna come from uh, Amir. Amir, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much for setting up this call. Amir Mansouri, uh, vice, uh, Assistant Vice President of uh, Rail and Transit WSP. Um, I just wanted to ask that uh, I was with uh, uh, zero emission bus manufacturers before, and I was handling HP vouchers for two years. And uh, it was mentioned by Michael that uh, post pandemic, there was a lot of supply crisis for the manufacturers. And uh, what we see is uh, kind of uh, a decline in the production capacity. So uh, I was wondering if uh, this at all is being addressed uh, as a problem, uh, because uh, regardless of how much fund we have or how much uh, aid or support or incentive we have for the customers or clients, uh, we need to have enough capacity to meet that demand. And uh, manufacturers are uh, really suffering uh, from over customizations and supply crisis post pandemic. 
uh, they have very little margins. So um, I just wanted to uh, put it out there and uh, kind of uh, ask if this has been ever addressed. Thank you. Uh, can you, I'm a little, I just lost you a little bit on the end. So what was the particular question? Again, if you could reset it, sorry. Yeah, um, I, uh, so I was wondering if, uh, since the, the whole incentive program is helping the clients um, with, the, uh, with lowering the cost for uh, going zero emission, uh, is there uh, like any solutions for also helping manufacturers? Uh, because you, we saw in 2023, uh, three, four uh, electric bus manufacturers filed for bankruptcy. So uh, they have very little margins. They have post-pandemic supply crisis. And uh, there are um, uh, status schedule uh, contracts, which has a price cap. So uh, all in all, and after uh, like even getting edge with vouchers, uh, they may end up uh, not getting paid after six months after delivering the buses because the transit agency may have a problem with their local DMV to register the buses. These are the real cases that I had to dealt with for the past two years. So I was wondering if this is being addressed that manufacturers are really suffering and the capacity is not meeting the demand. Well, you know, we, we have been working to try to, you know, address these issues if uh, with you know individual voucher requests, trying to get those processed as quickly as possible. But really, HFIP is intended to be a purchase incentive program for fleets, right? To encourage fleets to adopt newer technologies that they may not do otherwise, right? And so that that is really the underlying um, purpose of the program, and it's never really been directed towards manufacturers, but really towards influencing purchase decisions by fleets. And so that's kind of how where HFIP fits in in the different types of incentives that are out there and available. Other programs have different mandates, but HF is really uh, attacking the problem from that end only. So. Oh, we have time for one more quick question. If it's quick, Robert, I'm gonna go ahead and call you on, on you again. Uh, please unmute your microphone and state your name and affiliation. There it is, thank you very much. Um, and I will be quick. Uh, I just want to say I do like the uh, exploration of the fleet direct model. Um, I support the earlier comment on broadening uh, to include uh, incentives for smaller vehicles. Um, and I got questions on MSRP limits as well. Uh, we buy, except for our smaller vehicles, we buy very few vehicles that are not uh, special uh, configurations. None of them qualify for the uh, exceptions in the rule for uh, special use vehicles. Um, um, and that leads to the next thing, and that is uh, um, the vehicle choices that are out there, battery electric vehicles, uh, are really not going to work for us because we have uh, a, a huge need for, uh, uh, predominantly, we work, in, we work in remote locations. Our engines are used uh, for various functions, including onboard equipment, uh, air conditioning, whether it's uh, cooling or heating for employee comfort per OSHA requirements. Um, and while we, we're excited to hear about the hydrogen information and whatnot, uh, uh, we're concerned that the technologies will not be in place and, and the money before uh, our requirements to meet the, uh, uh, our purchase requirements uh, for, for ZEV vehicles. And um, we fear there's a crash coming. Uh, we don't think we're the only ones in this. And I, I don't know how, who to talk to at CARB about how we can get uh, some attention on some of this. Um, uh, I know that's not your this uh, team's job, but we're concerned. That's enough. So I think that was the last one, right, Eric? Yeah, I'm going to go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and and um, we're going to move on. Uh, the contact name and number uh, uh, emails are here. You can follow up with any of these. Uh, please be respectful of the next uh, uh, topic, and and so we won't take any questions in regards to HFIP for for the next topic. If we have time at the end, we can we can definitely answer some more questions. But uh, we're not taking any more HFIP questions uh, at this time. Yes, thanks, Eric, and I'll. Um want to segue through. Uh, so we 
you know, based on the number of questions there, we extended the allotted time over for HFIP because we do want to try to um, listen and hear your comments, gather those comments and uh, respond as best we can. So um, with that, the uh, if you refer to your agendas, again, there's a time slot in there. And so uh, depending on that, we're going to try to um, honor that those 45 or 50 minute time slots. So let's get started with the next uh, group. Uh, thanks, Will, for turning over. And I'll hand it over to um, Brandon Rose for uh, Innovative Small eFleet Pilot Project. Hi, actually, um, I'll be doing the ISAF program. Hello. Sorry, Brianna. Sorry, no sorry, worries. Sorry. Mix that over. It's okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Brianna Rocha. I am the CARB implementation lead for the Innovative Small E-Fleet Pilot Project, or ISAF for short. ISAF is a set aside of the HFIP program. Next slide, please. For the ISAF program, we are proposing to begin work on the design and development of the of a used truck voucher pilot concept that will take place next year during the 2024 to 2025 fiscal year for possible inclusion in following year's funding plans. We recognize that many smaller fleets generally purchase used vehicles instead of new ones because of the zero emission vehicle market, because of the zero emission vehicle market being um, just scaling up, there are very few, if any, used vehicles available to purchase. A used vehicle voucher program could help foster the market by reducing costs and increasing the supply of vehicles. In addition, the proposal would allow CARB to collect valuable information to inform future policies. For example, collecting cost data could provide valuable insight to establish vehicle residual values to establish, oh, yes. And for the, right now, there isn't much data available on that topic. The data in turn would be used by industry to support the development of key finance and insurance products for zero emission, zero emission vehicles and establish a fair value in the used vehicle market. A key aspect of the initial program design would be to determine a voucher level that would increase small fleet interest and help get them in zero emission vehicles while also not setting the voucher level to a point where it could cause vehicle prices to escalate. While there will be meetings in the future to discuss the details of the pilot, today we would like to hear your comments on the practicality and suggestions on what entities we should invite to future workshops. Can go on the next slide and we can open for comments. Okay, uh, first question or comment is going to come from Andrew. Andrew, I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation. Excellent. Thank you. Andrew Pontius again with Ave Electric. So, hi, Brianna. I'm excited <clears throat> to hear that you're talking about doing vouchers for used uh, trucks. And just as you probably heard me a little bit ago say that I, I'm hoping for equality in the vouchers for retrofits versus new. I would also like to see equality for used versus new. This is for a couple of reasons. One is because when you have that uh, used truck, yes, the used truck is worth less than the new truck on the on the uh, on the electric side, but it's also worth less on the on the diesel side if you're doing a direct comparison. And so, to keep things really simple and not confuse people with lots of sliding scales and complexities, I'd really like to see all the vouchers be equal for retrofit used and uh, and new. And so uh, at the same time as giving you that feedback, I'm reinforcing my feedback that I'd like to see ISEF also have that equality for uh, retrofit versus new. Yes, Andrew, of course, equity is a pillar of these incentive projects. And that those points that you just made are definitely um, topics we've discussed internally, and we look forward to discussing them at future workshops. Thank you. Awesome. Look forward to talking with you. Okay, our next uh, question or comment is going to come from Wes Lowe. Wes, I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation. Bird Truck Center. Hi, this is Wes Lowe at Kingsburg Truck Center. The question I have is, if you're going to offer vouchers I'm used, I'm assuming that the any voucher, any vehicle that you've already issued a voucher on new that's been redeemed against the VIN number that in the used voucher program, that vehicle would not be eligible. Is that correct? Can you I think, I think you run I think you run the risk of 
of uh, um, somebody double dipping. If, if it's already been issued new and then you issue it again on a used one, are you going to put a, a uh, something in there to help prevent that from happening? Or do you want that to happen? Well, we, we don't want any, um, it's something we have considered and thank you for bringing up the point. It's something, this program pilot is just in the works. It's a concept that we want to develop. So it's some, definitely something to consider. I know we've funded through ISAF and through HFIP many um, new vehicles. So it's something we will take into mind going forward. Thank you, Wes. And we, all, we, we have a used truck side to our business as well. We stock about 160 used gas and diesel trucks. So we're really anxious to try to figure out how we're going to establish residual values on the new electric trucks as they as they uh, re-enter the used market. And we would love to participate in uh, help in uh, trying to identify what those values might look, look like as the uh, ACF rules roll out in 2027 for the non-priority uh, fleet. Yeah, it's, um, we would love to work together. That's actually a um, focus of this pilot. We want to collect more data and help establish those residual values and create a fair um, values in the market. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Our next uh, question or comment is going to come from uh, Lisa. Lisa, I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation. Hi, it's Lisa McGee, Tom Struck Center. Um, so to refer to your questions regarding this pilot project for used um, vehicle vouchers. So we do support used vehicle vouchers. We do believe there's a good market for that. I think in terms of understanding a little bit of what our lessons have learned been on the new truck market in this technology, um, Carb invented the zero emission powertrain certification to make sure that the fleets that were buying the technology had the elements of support services, parts, um, diagnostic tool sharing for local garages. And I think so we need to make sure that when we go into this used market, that we're also making sure that the end users have the support that they need and the OEMs have this obligation to make sure that they're doing their part. Um, so it's not just a one-off um, or too small of a group that, that maybe can't, if the OEM can't survive the market, that there is a useful life built into that product so that the garage dealers, the service centers can support that product beyond the useful life of maybe an OEM. Um, so, I, and that's kind of was the spirit behind zero emission powertrain cert. So I like to make sure that all retrofits have an aftermarket certification tied to it. And maybe there needs to be some uh, used special EO that Carb invented for um, zero, zero emission new trucks as well. And that's really it. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, those are very valuable tips. And I know we'll all probably work together going forward on this concept. Thank you. Um, at this time, I'm not seeing any other hands raised. If if I'll give it one more second, if anybody has any comments or questions in regards to this topic, please raise your hand now. Otherwise, we'll just uh, move on to the next uh, uh, topic and, and gain some extra time on the back end. Can we go on to the next slide so everyone has a moment to take the contact information? Okay, thank you. Perfect. I'm not seeing any uh, raised hands, so I think we can uh, we can move on to the next topic. Right. Hi, everybody. I am Brandon Rose, uh, and I am leading the Zero Emission Truck Loan Pilot Project. Uh, and so let me give you just sort of a quick overview of where the project stands and how it operates. Uh, the Zero Emission Loan Pilot Project, it builds on the legacy truck loan program that closed last year, August of 2023. It's administered by the California State Treasurer's Office under the California Pollution Control Financing Authority, or CPCFA, through the California Capital Access Program, or CalCap. So we use CPCFA a lot. Uh, this new program, uh, Zero Emission Loan Program, it opened on May 1st. It was allocated $5 million in the 2022-2023 funding plan. 
And we've actually identified and transferred about $4 million in unused truck loan program funds, the legacy program, to help augment the new program. We also anticipate that additional funding will become available as the existing legacy loans come to maturity and they are recaptured over time. So for the current funding plan, we're recommending a $5 million allocation from AQIP for the program. We estimate this will uh, support approximately 200 to 300 additional loans, but it really is completely dependent on the financed amount. And that really looks at how the incentives are stacked by the fleets uh, and the loan amount. So just a quick review, um, it works by providing qualified lenders with a loan loss reserve account. So what that means is for each enrolled loan, CAR puts 25% of the loan amount into a lender's account. The lender then builds up their account, and if they have a default, they can submit a claim form to recover their losses uh, against their account. And typically when these funds are available, um, banks and other lenders, they are better equipped to lend to businesses that need a little extra assistance. And they typically offer more favorable terms than businesses would otherwise qualify for. That's a little bit on, on the requirements. It's open to small fleets of 20 vehicles or less. This is up from 10 under the old legacy program. Uh, and we personally have aligned this with, with the H script small fleet requirements as well. It includes anything class 2B and greater and anything new or used that's on road and is a zero emission vehicle. Uh, so anything over 8,500 pounds gross vehicle weight rating. Uh, and to apply, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, an individual small fleet, they should contact a participating lender uh, the lender then you know, makes the loan and they, the lender submits all the paperwork straight to the administrator's CPCFA. Uh, what else is going on? Uh, we're also closely um, working closely with the California Energy Commission on an accompanying infrastructure loan support program uh, to help with chargers and, and fueling stations. And then Southern California Edison also has funded a similar loan program to support customers in their service tarry and uh, SCE is funding both vehicles. Uh, and the infrastructure as well. Uh, and they're all together on the program website and all the applications. Um, so that's sort of a summary. We're not recommending uh, any policy changes at this point, um, just adding some extra money into the program. So are there any um, questions or comments? Fine. Here we go. I have a couple of hands raised. Uh, first question or comment is going to come from Lisa McGee. Lisa McGee, please state your name and affiliation again. Hi, Lisa McGee, Tom's Truck Center. Uh, so this is this is great. I kind of have one question for clarifying because I, when I think I looked at this, the rates were pretty high. Is that still true? So the program doesn't directly subsidize a rate below market. Um, we, we still look at, the lenders are still responsible um, and they can use their own underwriting standards to determine what the appropriate interest rate should be for that customer, um, given the support of, of this program in the background. Um, so most of the time a fleet, um, some fleets that couldn't get into a loan at all are able to get into, and then other times a fleet can get, you know, a better, a better rate than they would otherwise get. Uh, we do have an interest rate cap. It's set at 20%, which has been the historical amount that we've used in the program for a, a long time. Uh, and that's to prevent predatory predatory lending, but most of the rates that we see are, are under that. Um, but a truck market rate, and you probably know better than me um, on the ground, but anywhere between say as little as maybe 8%, but a lot of them are probably 10 or 15% interest rates. Does that okay, help? So, yeah, it does help. So I guess I'll just give a comment, right? Because you, you bring up this, this, this interest rate is, it's all about the interest rate. Zero percent of a hundred is still zero, right? So, you know, so you know, it's 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 the devil's in that 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 underwriting process. And how I, I would like to see more of an education process happen with um, directly with these banks, right? Um, you know, and, and I even and I even add the CTC to that, the clean truck check, because until they know that there is a market that's basically, um, you know, having no future potentially in California, you know, I, I think that we're not moving as fast as we could be moving because they're they're the last people to the table. 
I'm also seeing the trucks as a service as a big as a new business model. And so when these people have no history, they're looked at in underwriting as a high risk, right? Whether it's insurance or whether it's interest. I just think there's more that we should be doing as an industry as a whole with the finance industry and the insurance industry, because you can give me the truck for free, but between the tax and the insurance and the interest, if I have interest at 10%, 10% of my capital costs up the 90% paid for, it's, it's, it's crazy what we're seeing. And we're seeing some of the best creditors not do deals because of this issue, because fuel cell ends another issue or adds another issue to it, because that's another whole concern from their perspective, because they have no knowledge of it. There's nothing, there's no book, there's no data for them to see or share. So I don't know what we can do, but I, I first of all, I think this is a great program. I'm not seeing the activity that I wish I could see because I'm seeing the same issues still repeating in interest cost based on values that still are too high for the industry. So this guy goes and gets underwriting. He's used to looking at a truck that's 100 or 200. Now he's at 500,000. That same bank will no longer float him because he can't afford it financially with his operational revenue. So they're just the devils in the details here. And I'm just telling you, we're having too many issues. You know, and I agree with you. Um, one thing I would say, we're trying to grow. I mean, the program just launched, um, but we're definitely trying to get more lenders involved and bring more competition into that marketplace. And so one of the things we're asking, if, if you don't see a lender, that a fleet doesn't see a lender that they typically use on that lender list, to let us know and we would be happy to reach out with program information, right? Because this program is completely free okay. for fleets and lenders to use, right? Um, so it's it's an excellent backstop, but you still, you know, you run into the situation where if somebody has sort of near bankable credit, uh, they still may not be able to get into a loan. Those are always, a, you know, most challenging situations. Uh, and then my one other thought, I mean, you see in ISAP, we were talking about um, potentially use vouchers, but we're always open and looking for creative new solutions solutions in the ISAP program. I help do the case by case on ISAP, as you know. Um, so if people have you know good ideas. We are always open to those suggestions to hear what else uh, we can be we can be doing or um, being more creative or trying to lower barriers to entry for these small fleets, especially. Oh, yeah, well, th that's helpful, I think, necessary. So I guess I'll, I'll give you a feedback real quick when I'm thinking about this. You know, we've got, you know, leasing and rentals, which I think is, is creating, has an opportunity to create some traction because it allows the person to take the investment off front. If these dealers um, and these other types of agencies that are going to procure um, trucks uh, to help, what we're looking at is like, we're looking at this as an opportunity to help them get comfortable in the technology. So I think, I think even dealers and loan program at limitedly a pilot project, right? Because if we can get more butts in the seats, then we can do a lot more than we're doing right now because the investment or the underwriting is causing problems. Um, and, and then when I look at the leases, we can put a residual on the other side between I think OEMs and dealers. We just have to make sure that we're covering our bases on a, not on a monthly, on a monthly basis. So I, I think there's a lot we can do with residual. And once we get into the used market, those same trucks that have been used through the first lease program can go into a used market. So I think, I think we just all need to get to the table to understand what the dealers do in the industry, both on used trucks and uh, used trucks um, as well. Absolutely, good comments. Do you have any other questions or comments? Tom, I'm not seeing any other uh, questions or hands raised. Um, give it another second, and then we can go ahead and move on to the next uh, uh, to the next topic. Perfect. And just a reminder, as I said before, if, if you take a look at the program website and you you know, don't see one of the lenders you commonly use on there, feel feel free to let us know. Shoot me an email. My email address is on the slide here, um, and we're happy to reach out to them and just get them a little bit of information about the program. As, as I said before, it is completely free to use. Okay, thank you. All right, folks, let's talk a little bit about the core project. Um, 
which stands for the Clean Off-Road Equipment Voucher Incentive Project. Uh, my name is Todd Sterling, uh, working on this, this project. Um, today, we're going to talk about um, the heavy duty project as we move forward in 2025. Uh, we're not here to be talking about the uh, currently scheduled launch of the program on August 13th next week or professional landscaping. I just want to make that clear before we get, get, get going here. Uh, next slide, please. So a little overview about the uh, core project. Uh, the core program is a first come, first serve project. Uh, core is intended to accelerate the deployment of advanced zero emission technology in the off-road sector by providing a streamlined way for fleets to access funding that will help offset the incremental costs of zero emission uh, technology, such as forklifts, TRUs, transportation, refrigeration units, uh, and construction and agriculture. Uh, core targets commercial ready products, which have not yet achieved a significant market foothold. Uh, this program also allows stacking. What that means is that you can use funding from this program and other incentive projects to, uh, as long as you follow the rules of both, and you can use funding for both of those for your project. Uh, Core also does not require scrappage, which is uh, scrapping one of your current pieces of equipment to be in the program. Additionally, there are enhancements for infrastructure, small businesses, and operations and disadvantaged communities. So right now, uh, we're requesting that the Core project received $14.9 million from the Air Quality Investment Funds. Uh, we plan to use those funds for small businesses only. Uh, that being said, we plan to keep much of core uh, the same as we have in the past, uh, but a couple of small changes we'd like to make. Uh, core is proposing to remove the mature zero emission off-road terminal tractors uh, used at freight facilities. Um, over the years, equipment of this type has been included in core. Uh, we re reduce the incentive amounts over the past few years. Uh, there are still other incentive programs that can allow incentives uh, for this equipment, such as CAP and Moyer. Um, in the future, uh, as higher gross combined weight rating, greater than 81,000 pound terminal tractors become available, uh, we would like to offer core incentives to those uh, terminal tractors and support the future carb, uh, cargo handling equipment regulatory requirements. Also, in lieu of the off-road certification, uh, we don't have an off-road certification like they do on the on-road side. Uh, we like to streamline the core equipment eligibility, uh, providing equipment manufacturers with an interest in core uh, eligibility with a, like a one-page form uh, of uh, supporting documentation. Uh, one other point, we'd also like to increase the voucher amount for the largest of forklifts, up to a million dollars per forklift. Uh, these forklifts are very similar to cargo handling equipment uh, with similar voucher amounts in the million dollar range, up to a million dollars. Uh, the next slide is uh, contact information. Uh, if you have questions or comments after this uh, meeting, you can always uh, reach out to us. We're always happy to answer questions in the future. So right now, um, Eric, we're gonna open up the uh, lines to answer any questions or comments about what we just talked about, that'd be great. Oh, good. Our first uh, comment or question is going to come from Joe. Joe, I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation. Hi, this is Joe Beak with the Babel Island Ferry. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Good. Thanks, Todd. Thanks, Eric. Um, I'd like to uh, give some input uh, relative to the uh, commercial harbor craft sector. Uh, and the voucher, the vouchers that are available in the catalog for um, exclusively vessel retrofit. Um, so unlike uh, any of the other categories in the program, uh, the equipment sets in this category are restricted to retrofit of existing equipment. Um, we are, and I, I would uh, recommend that the program broaden that to include vessel replacement uh, to not exclude vessel replacement. Um, there's already equipment in the catalog that could be used in either a retrofit or a replacement uh, scenario. Um, so the uh, uh, 
um, emission reduction goals would be met uh, in exactly the same way. Uh, so this, you know, this modification would achieve the same emission reduction. Uh, you know, a, a new vessel would achieve the same emission reduction as a retrofit. Um, this is going to broaden the potential end users for the equipment in the catalog. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, instead of being restricted to a retrofit, um, if you could use a replacement, a, a vessel replacement, use the equipment in a vessel replacement, uh, then there'd be more users. Um, I do think this is in alignment with the greater catalog as a whole, where retrofit is not a restriction placed on other other equipment types. Um, okay, so Joe, yeah. can I ask a quick question? Um, so, so right now, I think the the core uh, uh, voucher allows for new vessel, like in, like you, you, you purchase a new vessel or you can uh, replace the powertrain on the current vessel. So um, what, what I don't understand what, what the, the replacement is. Is that, is that something different that I'm not aware of? Right, so uh, in our case, uh, we, need, we um, need a new vessel in order to install this equipment. Uh, so that's not considered a retrofit. We can't take the existing equipment set and put it in the existing vessel. The vessel's not able to carry that equipment. Um, we'll have to put it in a new vessel. Um, so, but but the equipment set can only be used as a retrofit. It can only be installed in an old vessel. Uh, I see what you're saying. So the 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 the, the choice that you have in in the catalog right now is for replacement or uh, retrofit only, not a new retrofit vessel. only. Yeah, the new. Got yeah, there it. Are okay. Some okay. New, I see. I see what you're saying. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah, there are some there are some new vessels in the catalog, but they're very limited. I mean, our our vessel is one of a kind, so we we'll, we would never get our vessel in the catalog because it's never going to be considered commercially available. It's a it's a one of a kind. But the equipment is set for a retrofit as opposed to installing it in an old boat or a new boat is it's the same equipment set. Got it. So, so let, let's 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 work together, uh, Joe and our team and whoever you choose as your power trainer or vessel builder, and work together so we can get that in the catalog to 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 fit your needs. Would that would that help you out? Well, no. It's what, what Joe's so hold on. I'm, I'm not with, so yeah. yeah let me, so what Joe would like to do. What they want is they want changes. I think, and if I'm I'm expressing this correctly, Joe, which what you would like is for the ability to use a conversion kit in a new vessel, as opposed to having to use a conversion kit in an existing vessel. Because we have two options in core. We have you can you can we we fund full vessels and we fund conversion kits but those conversion kits are for um in effect you know repowering uh 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 or or replacing a diesel engine or an ice engine in a in a um a existing vessel is that what you're is yes, that what that, you're right 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 yep yeah no the equipment set you wouldn't need to add anything to the catalog you just need to remove the restriction that it only go on an old boat it's the same. It's I can use the same item in the catalog already. Okay. And 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 the, and the mission it. reduction is the same. It. And it's it. it's right. spot on. It's spot right. on to the mission of the program. It's, it achieves right. the exact same mission goal. Okay. That that's something we'll have to work on uh, outside of this meeting, uh, Joe. But uh, something we can definitely work on. Great. Thanks, Todd. Thank you, Eric. Our next. Uh comment or question is going to come from Greg. Greg, I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation. Can you hear me? Yes, we yes, can hear, we you, can now. hear you now. Yeah, perfect. A little delay there. Uh, good afternoon. Yeah, Greg Lawnmilk with uh, Danner. Um, really, first and foremost, Todd, uh, thank you uh, for uh, for uh, the core program. It's been fantastic, I think, for many of us. My my comment, I think, is around um, our the MPU category. I think a lot of a lot of the um, discussion today on all these topics is really about the load, right? Whether it's a truck or a forklift or whatever we're talking about is really on the load side. The MPU category is a little bit unique in that it's not the load; it's a 
device that transfers uh, energy power or charging. And uh, what we're finding is, you know, it's often providing um, able to be implemented faster because there's less permitting, higher flexibility. And as we're out with many of our um, other constituents in this category, we're finding out that um, these off-road customers are finding the use for the MPU across multiple ecosystems. So for example, if they have an excavator, which is the off-road voucher for core, um, and they're using an MPU, they're also charging their on-highway dump truck uh, with the same vehicle, right? Um, ag, similar with a tractor and a semi, um, even a warehouse. They'll have, they'll have the, you know, the semi at the warehouse and be able to use the MPU to charge, but they don't have it necessarily when it's on-road. Um, plus, it allows for that kind of temporary capability when it's uh, dynamic, right? You don't know what your job site's going to look like. You're maybe putting stuff in. You haven't figured everything out. It allows you to learn to be dynamic. And so my comment is that uh, we strongly support and really appreciative of us being in the MPU category, but I think with the accounting, it's allow it's the way it's kind of worked is we either have to be in the core, the MPU categories either got to be in the core um, or some other category, but it can't be in both. And I think from listening to customers, listening to a lot of customers and from um other um, OEMs in the same space, as well as uh, at, at the ACT show, for example, there's a strong demand for this MPU category across multiple ecosystems, whether it's on highway, heavy heavy transit uh, or off-road like we have here. And I just uh, ask that maybe as we continue to evolve and learn as a broad group in, in terms of how we um, continue to supply energy and provide mobile energy and charging, uh, this might be one of those categories that we need to continue to look at to, to expand beyond just where it is in core. No, I, I hear Greg that uh, we, we had um, every once in a while that, that but uh, core is for off-road. And so we're trying to keep it that way. So um, off-road is always, always sort of the um, afterthought after on-road. So to keep uh, something like this in the off-road space, so off-road equipment can develop and can expand. Um, I think that's important also. So there are other programs, uh, maybe with CEC, that may be able to help uh, incentivize uh, your product. Uh, it does definitely has a space in, in other places, um, but uh, here at Core, we, we like to keep it um, off-road and uh, powering off-road equipment. Okay, our next uh, question or comment is going to come from uh, Chris. Chris, I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone. Please state your name and, and affiliation. Yes, good afternoon. Chris Bender with Laser Logistics and appreciate the opportunity to provide comment today. Um, we're a, a large operator of terminal tractors. We're, we're obviously a big fan of the core program, um, have utilized the core program. Um, and I know a lot of folks do as well. Right, so it's probably the most oversubscribed category that you have because it is, you know, a, a reasonably mature technology. But there's still a lot of work to do in this space. There's a lot of folks that that can really make an impact on air quality getting these uh, in across the state. So would just encourage you understand the need to um, look at other funding categories, um, but would certainly would encourage you to reevaluate. Uh, at least offering some type of incentive going forward in, in 24, 25 for terminal tractors, because uh, again, I do fully expect that uh, it will be the uh, most commonly oversubscribed category again uh, this year when it opens uh, next week. So thank you for taking the opportunity. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it. Our next uh, comment or question is going to come from uh, Tatum. Tatum, I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, Tatum Onan calling from uh, KTC. And um, I'm familiarizing myself with the core program right now, but I was hoping to find out and just confirm if core is stackable with anything um, like HFIP, um, specifically in regards to like a reefer unit for an EV. Yeah, so so um, usually it, the stackable is just on one piece of equipment. So there would be the TRU and say core would cover half the cost and maybe the DARE district has another program and they could cover for the cost and they could stack those two uh, incentive programs to, to help cover the cost of the uh, equipment. Uh, we haven't really done a like a core HBIP 
like where it'd be the trailer and the and the uh, 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 trailer and the and the semi. Uh, but that's something we can look at in the future. Our uh, next uh, comment or question is going to come from Lisa McGee. Lisa, I'm going to unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation. Hi, Lisa McGee, Tom's Truck Center. So I had some comments specifically to start with on the trues. Um, first of all, I do think this is a great program and encouraged to see um, the amount of demand. So I would love to see how we can solve, especially when I think about the mandates on the true side, you know, uh, and as we move into the trailer side, we know this is a huge market. So I almost feel like the core program needs to have a better budget to support the demand. We did that in HFIP and I think we solved those problems eventually, but I think it's time for this program to solve that problem. Um, and so um, realizing that the true is under the mandates and we've got a pretty large market of customers that fit into this category um, and knowing that you've got the gas, the diesel and or the e-truck that would satisfy the compliance for um, as long as the E motor, it's or as long as the reefer motor is an E. Um, I wanna get clarification because I'm getting mixed signals. I wanna make sure first I, before I ask this question, is a battery standalone plus a direct drive component for the reefer truck, is that eligible as equipment in the catalog? Because I see some in there, and I want to make sure I'm interpreting that correctly. Right. So, so the uh, TRU category and in, in core is should be zero emission only. So it shouldn't have a the the equipment in there should not have a like a like a generator on the the rear, rear axle or hub that would cause you know create more emissions from the okay. uh, diesel diesel. Uh, tractor um, there there are some in there that have a battery uh, regeneration uh, that would you know just, or not, not battery but uh, brake regeneration okay. but, but not not a generator okay good okay so then so but so then you are allowing the direct drive which is I guess it's really not an off the road equipment but you're allowing it is that correct for 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 the zero emission part yeah okay so then so then in the true there is two types of equipment that are eligible in the catalog, which is either a standalone with the battery pack that would be um, creating the reefer or a direct drive. Is that accurate? I think the direct drive works with the batteries. I don't think there's anything in there that's all. Uh, oh, okay. Better, okay, better. got it. Okay, got it. Okay, that's helpful then. Um, I guess can you guys have limited specs on there in terms of details. I, I don't put limited specs as far as. Limited, do you have limited details on the spec. Um, well, the the implementation manual is pretty clear. I think I'm trying to find. No, but not the this. manual. The um, the catalog doesn't have the specs clearly right. the, in, okay. identifying details. So that's it's hard. Anyways, I just want to let you know. I, I'd like to see the details on that a little more clearer for the stakeholders. Okay, um, that's a good idea. And, and then the voucher determination. I you know when I'm looking at these and I'm seeing capacity from 10 kilowatts to let's call it a hundred kilowatts. And I'm seeing the price point, not much different between the two. Um, I would like to, in this particular category, see that the kilowatt hour capacity to be awarded a rebate. And I would like to consider if if you're looking at the installation costs, I know you're not at the moment, but I just want to see some, some solutions that make the stakeholders move faster than slower. And I just have, that's common. I would like to see maybe for this, particular category that's under a strict mandate and that's going to continue to grow. And there are a lot of small independent operators, how we can continue to help them. And I'm just want to see if maybe that voucher price is appropriately um, uh, determined by the capacity. And then also maybe if we can consider installation costs, um, because I feel like the capacity, if it's not managed well, then it might influence a higher MSRP. Um Two great comments, Lisa. I think that uh, I think at our last work group meeting, just for core back in March, uh, we tried to, to do a cross the board, you know, uh, voucher amount for for all different types of equipment. It's really really difficult for off road since they're so so varied in, in different sizes and different work and and, and different efficiencies. Uh, but I would love to get some more data and some more information on the TRUs to uh, kind of nail that down in this area. Okay, it'd be okay. great to to get that. 
And then okay. as far as insulation costs, uh, we can talk about that. Yeah, maybe. I mean, just down the road. I mean, I just feel the small guys are the small guys. I'm just I know you guys are focused on that. So you've done a great job in this program. So I'm encouraged by it. And then last but not least, because the market is currently allowing DC to charging in trues, even though you're not allowing it today. I found that odd, even though equipment is available today. So I'm just curious if you could consider that. I know it's too short of a notice now, but um, we're a little behind the eight ball in terms of what is available in the market. Um, I think this could continue to deliver better experiences by stakeholders um, that don't have chargers because they could get a faster fill and they could go to the public and essentially um, use equipment. So, and last but not least on the MPU, this is just feedback. Um, I will, someone was giving you comments early on the MPU. I do think this is a, a, a very, very good category that deserves more attention to. I don't know what to add other than say that I know the tethering has kind of got its obstacles to the industry. Um, and maybe there could be an hours associated with that because I think there's a great solution here that if this was plugged in, if this was non-plugged in during peak time, we could eliminate the capacity constraints and the costs associated with this type of equipment because it's it's necessary and needed. Um, I would love to add something like this to my to my projects, but I just have that's just my feedback. I just think there's more we can do with MPUs. And I think there's more to come, but I'd like to see you guys consider maybe hours on the grid instead of 100% off the grid. I'd love to talk to you more about that, Lisa, and, and, okay. and how that could help your 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 industry and 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 yourself. That'd be, that'd be great to hear. Okay. Our next uh, comment or question is going to come from Brian. Brian, I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, this is Brian Kwok with ANA Energy. Uh, thank Hi, you for uh, this webinar. It's exciting. Yeah, I noticed that you're looking to potentially uh, focus on smaller businesses. Would that also enable companies like ourselves who produce smaller kilowatt hour solutions to the off-road category for MPU? Um, so uh, to be opened up, I guess I have to requesting a, maybe a revision to say if you're focusing on small businesses, um, maybe they don't require 250 kilowatt hours of energy storage, maybe subs substantially less. So is that uh, something on the table or is it open to discussion in the future? Uh, we're, we're right now the the MPU units uh, we have at the bottom at uh, forty kilowatt hours, so it's pretty pretty small. Um, just because you're a small business doesn't mean you you need a small uh, MPU, right? But um, right. that's that's kind of where we set it up. Um, that's right that we found is right at the line where it gets to be more on the consumer side instead of the professional side. But uh, always always open for comments uh, when when we go back into the implementation menu. Yeah, because uh, you know we use a unique technology that uh, can cycle a lot more and charge and discharge faster, uh, but we use a lot less batteries and batteries that last twenty five plus years. So I know we have some discussions prior, but uh, it kind of penalizes those that are looking at maybe some leading edge technology that isn't as commonplace. So yeah, just uh, just to put that out there and see if that's for open discussion in the future. Appreciate it. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Our next uh, comment or question is going to come from uh, Brooke. Brooke, uh, you can uh, unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation. Hi, everyone. Brooke Bushart with ConMet. Was just curious if you could expand a little bit more on what you guys mean by the streamlined equipment eligibility and what that would look like for the manufacturers. Yeah, so so right now, uh, for a equipment manufacturers coming to the core program, it's a pretty extensive process. Uh, it's a really um, a lot of paperwork and a lot of back and forth, not just for the OEM, but also on the, the carb side. So we're trying to look for like a one-page kind of fill out to get make it a little bit clearer for the OEM to uh, complete. 
Um, and also, uh, you know, it's not a, a certification program, but we are, we're trying to make sure that the equipment that comes to the core program is you know, commercially available, make sure it's, you know, hardy and, and works well in the field and it kind of replaces the diesel that, that it's uh, taking over. So uh, we want to make sure those things happen, but uh, maybe a little more streamlined process to do that. Maybe, Got it. maybe, and maybe, maybe it can happen, maybe it can, but we'd, we'd like to see that. That makes sense. And 2025 is timeline estimate for that new application set up possibly. Right. So, so, so this meeting here is talking about the funding plan that would take the funding plan to the board um, here in October, November, uh, one of those, one of those months. Um, so we're looking at the, the forward, um, but we'll also have uh, meetings in the spring of 2025 to talk about, you know, updating core, well, things that didn't work so well uh, once we kick off here uh, next week. And uh, we'll be updating those uh, as, as we move forward in the spring of 2025. Okay, thank you. Our next uh, comment or question is going to come from Mark. Mark, I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation. Mark Roost, Sustainable Energy, Inc., and advisor to Silicon Valley Clean Cities Coalition. Um, I'm I'm sort of wondering about the uh, we're now looking at close to four kilowatt hours per kilogram for batteries, and that could be good for tractors and other off-road equipment. It could also fit you know, be proportionally small in volume as well. So that might there might be some ways in which that could fit into a reefer program. Um, you know, in a to make a cleaner, nicer, and smaller package overall. It also could be used for when you need range. I mean, the there's no range limit essentially with that kind of specific energy. Okay, if you want to uh, meet with the core team here in the next couple of months before we launch uh, for next year, get ready for next year, that that would be great to hear about your technology. Where 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 would that be geographically? Um, are you in we, Sacramento we or are you we're, in... we're in Sacramento and, and Riverside. Um, but we okay. all we meet um virtually all the time with, with different uh OEMs. Okay, great. So uh, we happen to meet with you, Mark. Okay, thank you very much. Here. Todd. Welcome. Our next uh, comment or question is going to come from Yabin. I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation. Yes, uh, this is Yabin from CNH. Uh, just one simple question regarding uh, what if there's leftover funding from this year? What's the plan for that? Right. So if you look at, uh, yeah, Ben, good, good to hear from you. Uh, if you look on the core website, the California core dot or webpage, it'll, it'll, it breaks down the uh, funding totals from, from for this year that when we launched on the 13th, um, a lot of the funding, you know, we, 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 we had this meeting, this meeting last year, we had $14.3 million and we thought that was all we're going to have. Um, but lucky or unlucky that uh, a lot of vouchers were uh, canceled or deleted or something happened and we ended up a little bit more funding and we were able to fund a lot more than we thought we were going to be able to fund. Uh, that is listed on our webpage. Um, maybe somebody linked can... it, Todd. I put it in the Thank chat. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate it. Um, and if you have any questions about that, uh, and then you can always uh, send us a note. Okay. Thanks, Todd. At this time, I'm not seeing any more questions or comments in regards to core. I'll give it one more one more call to call to hands, and if we don't have any hands raised, we can go ahead and move on to the next topic. Yeah, just before we do that, I just want to let everyone know um, Todd's been uh, the lead staff of CORE for the last several years. He's um, did this presentation, and you'll notice on the slide deck that Eric Brown is the lead staff, and so um, received a lot of great comments um, uh, during this session. So kind of helping uh, Todd preserve his time because he's moving still, he's going to still be within uh, ARB and MSCD, but he has uh, got 
uh, a new position in another section. So congratulations to Todd on that promotion. Uh, but please direct your inquiries to either the core uh, email that you see on there or Eric and myself. Yeah, and just to, uh, just on the tail end of that, I've, I've been working with Todd closely on core for over a year now, so I'm not I'm not new to core. I understand the core program fairly well. Definitely not to Todd's level, uh, the grandmaster of uh, of uh, of core, but uh, uh, but I, I I do have a pretty good base thanks to Todd and working uh, with him uh, for the last year. Okay, right, great. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. So seeing no more hands, we will uh, move on to the next, and that will be Mr. Matt Williams. Thank you so much, Young. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for sticking around for the last portion of today's work group. An update on the fiscal year 2024-2025 long-term heavy-duty investment strategy. My name is Matt Williams, and I am the lead staff. I'm joined today by my colleague, April Schmitz, who has supported development of the strategy. The manager overseeing the document is Jason Crow, who is, as I understand it, experiencing complete bliss on vacation. Very happy for him. We'll go to the next slide, please. In this portion of the meeting, we'll share an overview of updates to this year's heavy duty investment strategy and get feedback from our stakeholders. We'll start with an overview of the heavy duty investment strategy, the role of incentives, our 2024 metrics of success, and finally, investment priorities for the next three years. As a reminder, the heavy duty investment strategy will appear as an appendix to the fiscal year 2024 2025 annual funding plan for clean transportation incentives, but the strategy's scope is from fiscal year 2025 26 through fiscal year 27 28, and it does not make any funding decisions. All of that is done through the development of the funding plan alongside the legislature's annual budget. As such, we won't be discussing the fiscal year 24-25 budget or funding policy for this fiscal year. To hear more about that, we recommend you register to participate in the funding plan workshop scheduled for August 29th. You can learn more about that by clicking the link uh, I've placed in the chat. Next slide, please. The heavy duty investment strategy is CARB's long-term guidance document for clean transportation incentives funding, that being from low carbon transportation investments and the air quality improvement program. It covers three fiscal years, beginning with the upcoming budget year and is updated annually. The strategy serves as a roadmap showing how state incentives can spark, help spark private sector investment and create partnerships necessary to support the acceleration of clean technology advancement and market deployment in the heavy duty on and off-road sectors. It identifies key priority areas for investment that will maintain market momentum and work alongside regulations to reduce emissions from the heavy duty space. Each year, the heavy duty investment strategy document includes several key elements. This year's document will include an updated discussion on how our investments drive the technology advancement and market adoption of clean heavy duty technologies that, along with regulations, will allow the state to meet its climate and air quality goals. Updates on the current status of clean heavy duty vehicle and equipment technologies and their respective markets. Ways to report on the metrics of investment success new examples of what's happening in the industry by means of many case studies, an updated three-year set of recommendations for heavy-duty vehicle and off-road investments, the ways CARB is focusing investments on the communities and small businesses in greatest need of assistance, and an annual report on the progress we've made towards cleaning up the state's school bus fleet. CARB's investments support advanced technologies across the commercialization pathway. CARB has an array of incentives that accomplish various goals, from demonstrating pre-commercial technology to assisting under-resourced fleets and promoting equitable distribution of clean technology across the state. The heavy-duty investment strategy is specific to low-carbon transportation investments and the air quality improvement program, which together can fund a wider array of project types, but are focused on early market support and equity. 
For example, our advanced technology demonstration and pilot projects help accelerate the commercialization of emerging clean technologies, while our clean truck and bus voucher incentive project, better known as HVIP, focuses on helping small businesses access commercially available zero emission trucks. Next slide, please. The heavy duty investment strategy works to define the outcome successful investments should strive to achieve. Metrics developed for the strategy can be grouped into three broader categories, supporting healthy communities, supporting technology evolution, and growing the green economy. Tracking these metrics helps guide program design and helps demonstrate the impacts of our work. The metrics shown here are mostly quantifying some of the many benefits from HVIP and the Clean Off-Road Equipment Voucher and Center Project, CORE, but we are also working to enumerate the unique benefits supplied by our advanced technology demonstration and pilot projects, which have invested over $400 million so far. Those 32 projects have deployed over 600 units of advanced technology, many of them world first, from a battery electric freight locomotive and line haul service to the conversion of entire trucking fleets to zero emission. More than 99% of those investments have benefited priority populations. Notable updates to our programmatic metrics from last year include a massive jump in clean miles travel traveled in disadvantaged communities, with HVIP funded vehicles tallying over 155 million miles just in the past year, bringing the total to over 350 million. Also, a rapidly growing core catalog reflects a burgeoning market for commercially available zero emission equipment. Finally, the total investment leveraged by HVIP and core increased by another billion dollars since last year demonstrating the power of our programs to spur triple the investment from other public and private sources. A principal product of the heavy duty investment strategy is the three-year investment priorities table, which details our recommendations for low carbon transportation investments beginning next fiscal year and organized by the aims of our projects. Those being the demonstration of pre-commercial technology and scaled pilot deployments of early commercial technology, programs designed to accelerate broad market adoption, and equity projects, helping small fleets and priority populations access the cleanest commercially available technology. The table is intended to show our top priorities and is not exhaustive of all the types of projects we would or intend to fund given sufficient resources. In the interest of space, we are unable to include everything. So even if you expect to see uh, something on the table and it isn't there, it doesn't mean that it's not a category of interest to CARB. With a new fiscal year now added to the table for fiscal year 2027-28, staff worked with internal experts and industry advisors to develop proposed project category priorities. We also made a couple updates to the fiscal year 25-26 and 26-27 columns from last year's document. Some priorities guiding this year's update include a growing focus on ensuring equitable access to and disbursement of public funds, preparing additional off-road categories for regulation, and signaling to technology providers and to other market participants California's interest in accelerating the arrival of advanced technologies in demanding applications like ocean-going vessels and aviation. There's a lot going on there, so I'll give you some time to look over the table while I point out some highlights. The new third year is characterized by the narrowing of scope as more technologies graduate out of our incentive programs and we focus on demanding platforms and equity. Related to those demanding applications, you'll see a new abbreviation, AT, which stands for advanced technology before the most challenging applications. AT represents true stepping stones to zero emission in demanding applications, not just cleaner combustion, renewable fuels, or conventional hybrids. Some examples might include hydrogen turbine hybrids in aviation, zero emission capable hybrids in marine, and other solutions we're hoping to learn more about. Hydrogen ecosystems represent large scale production and use of hydrogen by an array of vehicle and equipment types, similar to or possibly in conjunction with the Arches Hydrogen Hub project. Off-road zero emission ecosystems includes proving out scale deployments of many technology types like zero emission TRUs and gen sets. And as the table shows, we're exploring new ideas of how to support secondary markets for clean technology and helping small fleets with financing and insurance assistance. We'll go ahead and go to the next slide. 
And we will come back to this table in just a minute. For our next steps, the draft funding plan is expected to be released at the end of next week with a workshop following at the end of the month. I've added a link to the chat where you'll find more information about the fiscal year 24-25 funding plan development process and how to get involved. We aim to have the heavy duty investment strategy finalized by the end of the month and have the final proposed funding plan and long-term heavy duty investment strategy out in October ahead of a November board hearing. Now we'll go back to the previous slide and we'd love to get your thoughts on the new three-year investment priorities table or any of the other updates to the heavy duty investment strategy I shared. If there are questions or comments, please raise your hand or press pound two if you're on the phone and we'll call on you. Please state your name and affiliation, if any, before beginning your question or comment. And I'll hand it over to Eric. Sounds good, Matt. Okay, our first uh, comment or question is gonna come from Mark. Mark, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation. So, hi, I'm Mark Roost, Sustainable Energy Inc. and advisor to Silicon Valley Clean Cities Coalition. And I'm excited and wondering, uh, there, there, besides the batteries and some solar, we've also got the wind turbine generator, which can be converted into a wheel motor, but it could also be converted, and we've designed for converting into a marine propulsion system. And so um, I wonder if you guys talk with people who are starting to do engineering design work on ships and boats and tugs and all kinds of different things, locomotives, which could use a high torque gearless motor, uh, which will in turn use a uh, substitute for neodymium that actually has greater pull force and much less cost and no, and no supply chain bottlenecks. Um, so we, we could be looking at a, a rapid transformation and we, the batteries could go in the ship and the solar could be laminated to sails and so you wind up with a combination of modern technology and sail power. Um, and I wonder if you guys, when we talk to the core program, maybe we could talk to you guys too about what what's involved in this. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, whenever you're scheduling a meeting with the core folks, if you um, are sharing some new developments or new technology options on, on the horizon, we always look forward to learning about what's coming up. Great, thank you. Thank you. Our next uh, comment or question is going to come from Layla. Layla, I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation. Layla, you got to unmute on your end. I, I, Layla, I, I'm Agmarov Nost. I know I butchered that. I apologize. There you go. Now you can should work. Uh, we're not. I'm not hearing you. I'm on Hello. My head. Oh, there you go. Hello. Yes. Are you hearing me? Yes, we, we hear you now. now. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lala Gamirov Nost. Uh, I am from Innovative Crystals. Um, I am receiving many uh, emails from CARP. I am presenting new innovative technologies. Uh, incorporated for less amount of heavy packs of batteries and also in other technologies as well. It is new materials and uh, NASA actually stopped that production. There were reasons for that. Um, I uh, will have a round table discussion uh, from CARV. They send me a few, uh, few days when I can come. Uh, different locations, San Diego, San Francisco, and so on, uh, to discuss these projects. It is what I want to know. When you saying about the a new, a new technology, uh, is it connected to a new, um, to new uh, sources of clean energy, or it is um, more about um, um, of course, very important equipment, a very important uh, different and other stuff, models uh, of road equipment models and so on. Are you really uh, 
Uh, I appeared, Layla, you might have cut off at the end, but I think I got the gist of your message. Yeah. Um, so uh, we are interested in learning lots. Now, what is within the scope of our work is like actual final vehicle applications. So we're not dabbling in like advanced material science or anything like that. We leave that up to um, yeah. the agencies that focus on that sort of work. These projects would be deploying a full complete vehicle system. So a complete vehicle technology, that doesn't mean it has to be fully commercial, but that is the scope of our work where we're looking at individual vehicles. We do dabble a little bit in infrastructure as well as it pertains to getting these vehicles and equipment out and operational, but that's uh, about the extent of it. Okay, because uh, actually I submitted for three year fiscal uh, proposal, actually for five, it was before 2025, 2030. Uh, and now they contacted with me uh, if we will work with that. Uh, it will be, of course, with collaboration with uh, University of California, different labs and Baker lab as well. So uh maybe i can send uh if i can contact with you uh you have uh, your information yeah uh, if i can contact you and maybe uh introduce in more detail about that sure can I, I, put, I put my okay. email in the chat um yeah and we'll be getting to the we'll have the contact information up there uh so you're welcome to email me it does sound like your work is is earlier than where we jump in, but feel free to contact me and we can talk more. Okay, so uh, yeah, uh, just one second, I will write it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next uh, comment or question is gonna come from Amir. Amir, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation. Amir Mansouri, uh, ZEV planning team, WSB. Um, I was wondering for the startups uh, who are working on the uh, total um, energy emission reduction and uh, air quality monitoring, um, are there any schemes for those and which, which one of these categories they uh, fall under? I think I'm going to need you to clarify a little more. I don't think I understand exactly what you're referring to. Um, uh, startups with new technology, uh, new companies, um, do, can they enjoy this type of investments that you listed here? Um, the ones who are concentrating on um, heavy duty, uh, total energy uh, consumption reduction or air quality monitoring, uh, those type of uh, technologies. Got it. Air quality monitoring wouldn't be within the scope of these projects. Uh, as I explained and shown in the table here, the sort of projects that within the scope of our investments are going to be pre-commercial or early commercial deployments of zero emission, uh, heavy duty on and off-road technologies, uh, increasing market acceleration through our voucher incentive programs like HFIP and CORE, uh, and then our equity programs that make it easier for uh, uh, smaller businesses to get into the cleanest available uh, zero emission technology. So that's the, the focus of our work. None of these investments would be for air quality monitoring, um, although CARB does do that sort of work. That is a different division in the agency. Um, and as for energy efficiency, um, that could potentially be a part of a project. For example, if it is a new propulsion system in something like an ocean going vessel that reduces total energy consumption in the work and therefore reduces emissions or implements a partially zero emission system, then in that case, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, how can someone uh, hypothetically, uh, can they get in touch with you to uh, kind of understand uh, what will be the first step to uh, determine if they can um, they can use this investment. Yeah, and perhaps I should clarify once more that the categories and dollar amounts that are shown here are not actual investments that we will be making. We don't have this money yet. The heavy duty investment strategy is a guidance document that sets priorities and uh, messages the types of projects that we would like to fund given the opportunity, given available resources, 
but our actual budgets are set annually by the legislature. So there's a separate process that happens annually, and that is our annual funding plan for clean transportation investment incentives. And I put a link uh, to more information about our upcoming workshop on that in the chat a little bit ago, if you want more information on that. The annual funding plan is where actual funding policy decisions are made based on the actual appropriations made by the legislature. So in the current fiscal year, fiscal year 24-25, the legislature made appropriations to our programs and it is the job of the annual funding plan to decide exactly how that money is, is spent and uh, what projects what project criteria is implemented for that fiscal year. So again, the difference here is that the heavy duty investment strategy is prospective. We do not actually have this money yet. The document is just meant to guide future funding plans. Noted, thank you very much. Very nice work. Thank you. Okay, our next uh, comment or question is going to come from Beverly. Beverly, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute your microphone. Uh, please state your name and affiliation. I am sorry, I had to step away for a moment, so I maybe missed a bit of what you were presenting, but <clears throat> excuse me, I'm with the Electric Vehicle Association of the California Central Coast. And um, in general, I want to make the statement that we have the use of hydrogen is required for certain um, industries that are unable to electrify such as um, chemistries, uh, uh, steel, and cement. And those industries have not had their, um, they haven't switched anything called green. Green doesn't really exist. Blue is simply the same old gray that comes 98% from fossil fuel and um, with adding carbon capture and storage, which only has one project where it's proven and only 3% where it's proven to actually have some effect. It doesn't, it doesn't work. It's proven over and over again that carbon capture and storage does not. So any money that's going towards hydrogen and people coming and saying, we haven't gotten enough, we have to develop, is, is really wasting our time. All of the large land vehicles are handled by um, the large corporations, Tesla, Daimler, Volvo. They've got the, the long distance vehicles handled by um, a battery electric. And as our grid is greening up on the in the five county central coast, we have a target of 100% renewables by 2030. Not sure if we'll make it. The state has 2035 that the grid will be renewable. Then we can plug directly into the grid. All these vehicles can plug directly into the grid and be zero emissions, not only locally, but uh, as far as their energy, uh, the uh, fuel that is used. So to be putting money for transportation into um, <clears throat> hydrogen is really a waste of our time and resources. Um, there are currently uh, charging stations that can be out in the ocean run entirely by wind energy. So they can you know, be 100% uh, renewable and uh, accommodate marine vehicles. Um, so I, I, I'm not exactly sure how, how much your um, projects here are, which, which levels of projects they're here for, but I just wanna make this as a general statement to CARB, CARB has been fooled by calling zero emission vehicles to include a hydrogen fuel cell because the hydrogen not only is not green, is not blue, it, it, it is going to take enormous amounts of money and enormous amounts of renewables to produce that when we could be plugging everything else, all of our transportation, all of our uh, appliances into electric that's renewable instead of wasting the time, the energy, the money, the resources on hydrogen. Great, hear you loud and clear, Beverly. Thank you so much.
Eric, uh, do we have more hands raised? Sorry about that. I was muted. I coughed, so I muted myself. Um, uh, we're going to um, uh, next uh, comment or question is going to come from Greg. Greg, I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone. Oh, Greg, you just lowered your hand, so I won't be calling on you. There you go. Here we go. You have to unmute on your end. There you go, sir. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Greg Lauderwolk with uh, Danner. Uh, more of a strategic question on this table. I appreciate you providing this table. It helps clarify and distill things. Um, a question just on strategy uh, with respect to what you have out late here. Uh, a lot of the off-road products that you have up here tend, uh, are growing in size and the technology isn't quite uh, mature yet, as you've alluded to in this presentation. Um, but we know that we've typically been using, um, I'll call it on highway or what's typically on the grid today for, for power distribution and charging. If you take conversely like mines, um, a lot of the rope shovels there today use different uh, forms of power that we don't use today um, in, in kind of the, the commercial marketplace. Like rope shovels are on a cable reel. They're using four megawatts, up to three or four megawatts of power at peak, which is significant. So my question to you here in the strategy is, is the funding here really targeted at the end products and the load? Or is there also monies in here to support some of the infrastructure and distribution that is unique to these products and given the size of it? Or is there another mechanism that's being used to fund that infrastructure distribution that is unique to the products you have listed there? Yeah, great question, Greg. And certainly in uh, the table is laid out by the general aims of our projects. If you look at that, top one that demos and pilots that is exactly where infrastructure is absolutely within the scope of the work that we do in helping to prove prove out pre-commercial or early commercial um, technologies those sort of projects like the demonstration and pilot projects uh, that we have been funding for the last decade or so those can include infrastructure and we want to see uh, complete projects coming in. And we often also work with our partners over at the California Energy Com Commission to uh, help fund infrastructure in that sense. Uh, I think in the future, when those much larger platforms, those more demanding platforms with perhaps necessary infrastructure tie-ins are becoming more commercial, we'll probably have to reassess our strategy and exactly how that's done. Currently, for commercially available on and off-road platforms, uh, we provide funding for the vehicle or equipment, uh, whereas funding can also be supplied by the California Energy Commission or the local utility to help with infrastructure costs. So I think as we, as we get further down the road and those technologies start to reach commercialization and broader market acceptance, we'll probably talk a little bit more about the best ways that our incentives and the work of the rest of the state can be leveraged to ensure those technologies are successful. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you. Okay, our next uh, comment or question is going to come from uh, Nico. Nico, uh, I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation. Uh, good afternoon. Nico Balcom for GTI Energy. Um, a quick question, maybe on uh, just on the clarification side of things. <clears throat> you include uh, temporary fueling um, in, the, uh, in 2025 and 2026. Um, does that include, uh, say, backup power to make sure that, say, both charging and hydrogen fueling infrastructure can be rolled out even if there are uh, grid limitations with regards to capacity? Yeah, the purpose of that temporary fueling is really to enable the accelerated deployment of vehicles ahead of infrastructure. It also represents the usage of uh, mobile fueling for uh, applications that don't have a home base. So things like construction or agricultural equipment where the equipment would need to be uh, charged or fueled in the field, uh, perhaps not returning to a home base. So there is quite an array of things that are included under that term of temporary fueling. Uh, now, I'm not sure if we had imagined that would be for funding sort of backup power to continue operations in the event of a grid disconnection or other power failure. 
Um, but we can definitely think more on that and happy to talk more offline as well, if you have more ideas. Yeah, that, that, that would be great because uh, temporary fueling is one thing, but even in the case of temporary fueling, the question is uh, how do you generate the power to run those systems? Um, do you rely on minimal grid connections or uh, do you have backup generators that are zero emission? Uh, so that that yeah that would be good to discuss that a little bit more um, just from the fact that currently uh, grid has has its challenges especially where it comes to rollout and doing things on the timelines that uh, we would like to see thank you thank you nika our next uh comment or question is going to come from jamie jamie i'm going to go ahead and unmute your, unmute your microphone please state your name and affiliation Great. Uh, Jamie Levin with the Center for Transportation and the Environment. And Matt, I, I second what Nico just uh, referred to. And I'm really glad you have temporary fueling in the, the mix because we're, we're working with a lot of transit agencies that are converting to hydrogen, the fuel cell. They're seeing the advantages of that. They want more. And just keeping up with the fueling, long-term permanent fueling requirements, it takes time. It takes lead time. And having some sort of temporary, robust temporary fueling uh, set up or network will will be, I think, extremely valuable. But my main question, Matt, is: Have you been uh, conversing with Arches? You know, now that California received over a billion dollars under the uh, the hydrogen uh, DOE hub program, and we're very CTE is very involved in that. Uh, there's still a big gap here in being able to fund vehicles and certain technologies. And I know these numbers are aspirational, but I think it's important how the state is going to leverage the funding that it's getting out of the federal government uh, to take advantage of that over the next, really next five, five to eight years. So I wanted to know, are you, structuring this or strategizing as it relates to programs of, of, of that sort? I'll say that the integration for this document specifically with Arches is not deep, but we do have that connection. Of course, CARB is deeply involved in the Arches project and we maintain really good internal communication. Um, as you know, Arches is still kind of coming together, and I think it's going to take time to see exactly how we can best interface. And then there's the complicating factor of the current budget situation at the state level. We don't have a lot of funding um, in this current budget year, and in this current budget year, because of that, we're not proposing any new advanced technology demonstration pilot projects, which would really be the perfect intersection with Arches. Now, we hope, of course, that next year uh, the legislature would give us an appropriation that we could use for advanced technology demonstration and pilot projects. Um, but, of course, that's not guaranteed. So it, there is a level of, co of coordination at this point. It is mostly wait and see. But I think that we will be able to change strategy and work more closely together in the near future. Yeah, and, and look, to be more specific, uh, Arches has a very targeted goal that the federal government's aware of, of 1,000 fuel cell buses. We're working with 13 transit agencies to play that out, and uh, up to or over 5,000 Class 8 fuel cell trucks that will have the capability to do regional haul as well as drayage, and we need subsidies. I mean, the state has to play a big role in this. Uh, the governor's office is aware of it, uh, but those are the numbers that we really have to uh, focus on how we're going to help subsidize that. And hopefully we'll see with volume, like all of this with volume production, whether it's vehicles or fuel price, we're going to see uh, a, a reduction in, in, in the MSRP and in the capital expense, and therefore the subsidies won't need to be as as much, but to to as you've identified market acceleration and market equity, we're going to need to bridge that valley of death gap to do those thousand buses, to do those five thousand uh, trucks. Yeah, and so I'll I'll I think the best recommendation for now is to maintain good contact with the HFIP program, and I know that you already do that, Jamie, um, to make sure that 
that program is well coordinated with Arch's rollout. Um, that would be our primary mechanism for supplying funding, both for trucks and buses. And then, of course, as I'm sure you do, maintaining good contact with the California State Transportation Agency, CALSTA, which holds the majority of the funding for uh, zero emission buses. Right. No, I do keep in touch with both. So I just wanted yeah. to go on record with a comment. I appreciate that. Thanks. Thank you, Jamie. Good to hear from you. Our next uh, comment or question is going to come from Lisa. Lisa, I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation. Hi there. Thank you. Um, Lisa, Tom's Truck Center. I have a few comments here. So I want to start with the fuel cell. I want to also announce that Tom's Trucks is opening up a modular temporary refueling on this Friday. So we'll have eventually 2,000 kilograms a day offered. Um, so um, that'll be through a Hila project. So I really like seeing that you guys are emphasizing this program um, because it's really necessary. The cost of the equipment is enormous. So in, in addition to the fuel cell, I want to think that we really need to grow their hydrogen fuel cell technologies equipment and vehicles program somehow, some way, class seven, class seven, plus six, seven, and eight, in my opinion. Um, we need to get to 3.5 to four kilograms per minute dispensing and acceptance by the equipment. Um, we need to have fully 700 bar installed uh, co with the correct type of tanks that allow the 700 bar fully. Otherwise you don't have usability. Um, additionally, we need to advance the development of fuel cell with the supply chain components um, that the OEMs depend on. Um, that's, you know, uh, you know, we need advancements there because we're not going to get to the 700 bar reliably. Um, and a metric that sets an expectation that minimizes the losses um, in the equipment design, because right now we're facing enormous losses. It's got to be subsidized by somebody um, if it's not going to be at the dispense tank cost in terms of kilogram costs. And... Um, and on the modular side of that, I just want to add that understanding the requirements of the equipment, I think, um, needs to be better supported. Um, but I think that on a jurisdictional level, we're seeing some, you know, Hyla's done a great job. Nicola and Hyla have done a fabulous job with what they're doing in the industry. And I think this, is, this could be easily duplicated on a level, but the cost is prohibiting these types of deployments. So um, I just would like to see something done on that, on that particular technology with temporary fueling. Um, growing the interoperability uh, testing for the OEM manufacturers, as well as the vehicles, charging companies, and fuel cell dispensing companies, we don't have enough interoperability testing on the medium heavy duty side. This is creating some aftermarket um, glitches, okay, <laughs> in terms of commercially available equipment because everything has to talk together. It's not really being there's not really a hub or a testing standard that I think will cover the costs associated with it. Um, and then I'm going to go on to the true side on the truck reefer units. Um, I think adding a direct drive integration for reefer trucks is really necessary. This is a, a, a program that's already, or vocation that's already being regulated, yet there is not a lot of equipment out there yet. I know it's to be determined, but I almost think the integration and the installs of it needs to be supported in a project. Um, and growing the affordability and equity associated with access to independent owner operators as maybe a turnkey solution or hub, even for that market of locations, to include the finance, the insurance, basically no upfront costs and, and a fueling solution somehow, some way. Um, I'd like to see accelerated adoption for this particular small fleet operators that face clean truck check. When they face clean truck check in year 2027, when they have to get a clean truck check every three months, um, or every four months, right? Three, no, three set every three months. You know, it's either going to be prohibited, um, not costly for them to be able to maintain. Um, and so I think there needs to be something, something with the educational piece for these small fleets. Um, and um, the MPUs is my last comment. I think I'd also like to see something for off-road equipment to also, I think I shared this in the previous comments, but to provide a temporary solution for uh, for the grid when it's just not available and you have to go through really long permitting processes to support these temporary fueling systems, including fuel cell um, and maybe other projects that are being pop-up projects within a premises that needs another service added. So that's pretty much everything I have to say. <laughs> 
Yeah, a, a fantastic Christmas list, Lisa. All things we also want to see and uh, keep all of them in mind as we go forward. Thank you. Our uh, next uh, comment or question is going to come from Tom. Tom, I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation. Hi, my name is Tom Carroll. I'm with uh, Blue Star Gas. And my comment question is surrounding the investment priorities. So you're aware of the ZEV purchase exemption list, correct? For what so specifically? Lists of configurations of vehicles are not that are not currently in production or in the foreseeable future of production for zero emission vehicles, such as bucket trucks, boom trucks, dump trucks. Uh, you're talking trucks. about the Vantaclean fleets regulation? Yes. Okay, thank you. So my question is, is that there has there been given any thought or strategy to these investment priorities as we go down the road? these vehicles that are not available, that are on the exemption list, as they become available, is there any mechanism in place to hold back some of these funding for those types of vehicles? Because they, they may not be available for a few years. And if you go through this process and all the money is spent before those vehicles even become available, it just doesn't seem equitable. So I'm, I'm curious if there's been any thought given to prioritizing money for that sector of the uh, regulation well you'll certainly see that in the priorities table we list things like specialty eptos like you mentioned about um, other heavy specialty vehicles emergency vehicles things like that those are absolutely in mind we know that those are coming we want to make sure to fund them which is why we signal our intention to do so in this table here of course, it's always challenging. This document operates prospectively and not with any individual appropriation. Funding policies are not actually set in this document. Those are mostly set by the legislature in their appropriations to us and then programmed through the annual funding plan. So it is difficult. Um, I do recommend keeping in touch with the existing programs like HFIP and CORE and talking to them about their policies for how they are um, running the program and spending the appropriations that they already have. Um, but within the scope of this document, we really don't have the ability or authority or even the money to make those reservations. The best we can do is to signal to our stakeholders and to the legislature through this document that we see these technologies coming in the near future and we think that they are worthy of investment and we list them as priorities as such. Thank you. Thank you. Our next uh, question or comment is going to come from Walter. Walter, I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation. Hi, can you hear me? I we can. can. Hear you. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Walter Yang, New Flyer, um, OEM for uh, public sector for the uh, fuel cell buses and electric vehicles. Um, so my comment is uh, really regarding maybe some reiteration that um, may have already come from New Flyer to CARB and HFIP and TetraTech in regards to um, the, the process for uh, submitting vouchers on behalf of public transit agencies. Uh, while we know that this funding, grant funding is tremendously valuable and helpful to the public agencies, the process in which the OEMs are, are um, responsible for submitting the vouchers is becoming more and more cumbersome. Um, if these were just, you know, few buses, um, maybe it's designed around a dealer uh, that may have few buses throughout the year, um, that would be manageable. But as we are seeing this demand grow into hundreds and hundreds of buses, um, we are needing to allocate a dedicated um, person just to be able to manage this program on the OEM side. And it's um, and, and as we see the demand, uh, certainly around hydrogen, and it's, uh, it's been, been there for the electric side, um, grow uh, more and more through the uh, years, it, it's becoming um, more and more challenging for the uh, OEMs. Um, 
uh, with the number of uh, demand growing. So didn't know if uh, that was already something that, um, that you all had heard or maybe considering, but I uh, wanted to add that um, comment as, uh, as we are seeing uh, additional difficulties uh, with this on the um, submission side. Thanks, Thank Walter. Yeah, definitely you're aware of that from my time working on HVIP. Um, of course, the day-to-day -day policies, the mechanisms by which HFIP works, those are all policies set by the HFIP program and not the heavy-duty investment strategy. So mm -hmm. you would be working with the HFIP program staff, the Ender, the uh, lead Ender Atwal uh, spoke earlier today, um, and his contact information is in the slides, I believe. Got it. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Our next uh, comment or question is going to come from Mark. Mark, I'm going to unmute your microphone. Please state your name and affiliation. Thank you, Mark Roost, Sustainable Energy, Inc., an advisor to Silicon Valley Clean Cities Coalition, focused on solar, um, where you have a shortage in supply of electricity in the grid particularly. Um, within a couple of years, there should be very ready availability of solar that's probably going to be over 50% efficient in terms of average conversion efficiency, not peak, um, and low in cost as well. Uh, so there's the, and there's a couple versions of that, um, and it might be good to talk to you guys to find out whether what you think about heavy duty canopies over parking and driveways with ceramic tiles or lighter weight canopies with uh, inkjet and laser fired uh, thin film over sheet metal. Because some of that, and both of those at the, at the kind of numbers I'm talking about are better. Those are the latest formulas that we've come up with. Yeah, and Mark, that, if you have help any, yeah, any yeah. other um, like new developments or things to share with us, please reach out. My email's in the chat and we can uh, talk some more. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, at this time, I'm not seeing any more hands raised or comments or questions. Okay. Uh, well, so this is all we have for you today. We will post the recording of this meeting along with a list of participants in the next couple of weeks. I think at this time, since we have a little extra time before the webinar is up, we'll open it up one more time for questions or comments on anything that we discussed today. As before, please raise your hand or press pound two and we'll call on you. Please state your name and affiliation, if any, before beginning your question or comment. I'm not seeing anything, Matt. Okay, great. Um, well, if you think of any additional questions or feedback after the conclusion of this work group, feel free to email any of us with your comments or questions about the heavy duty investment strategy, and we'd be happy to talk more. Based on our timeline, we will only be able to incorporate feedback provided before September 1st. Young? Great. Thanks, Matt, for uh, that presentation. Uh, I do want to kind of uh, uh, close this out uh, since there are no more comments. Thank you everyone again for um, attending today's joint session. Uh, as I mentioned, it's just a really heavy schedule. Um, hopefully though, that was beneficial to y'all to hear all the different um, projects and updates going on as we move forward with the funding plan for this year. Um, and lots of great comments um, and a lot of good discussion. I can speak to HVIP and CORE, uh, I'm sure um, well, we just talked about uh, Matt's topic um, for ISEF, uh, maybe someone else would want to jump in on that side, but for HVIP and CORE, uh, I'll say for CORE that there was a lot of encouraging comments there. Uh, definitely want to hear your feedback about uh, different uh, equipment categories, um, heard about the vessel replacement idea. I think Lisa looked forward to reaching out to you, Lisa uh, McGee, to hear your comments about TRUs and MPUs. Um, so, oh, sorry. Nope, bad timing. Nope, <laughs> sorry. My son just walked in, oh, of course, right at the end. Um, okay, and on the HDIP side, definitely heard 
uh, a lot of comments on that. I'm looking at some of my notes here and definitely I think there uh, is, we hear you and recognize that there is a process and a number of steps that need to occur along the way during the voucher redemption timeline and that process. Um, I balance that by saying that on carbs and we're looking to also, you know, make sure that we're abiding by all the laws and oversight requirements we have, such as like labor law requirements, that's fairly new. Um, we have the registration requirements and ultimately the delivery of the vehicle. So, but we're looking forward to continuing to work with you uh, through that process. We are getting those implementation uh, manual out shortly. Um, and let's see, what else can I add in there? Uh, but again, I am the new manager, so uh, feel free to reach out to Ender or myself. Um, I'm getting up to speed on all of these things, uh, but look forward to working with you all. So I will stop right there and turn it over to if Anne-Marie or if Peter, if either of you had any other closing comments you'd like to add. Okay, so I think with that, we will um, sign off. And once again, thank you everyone for your um, spending time with, uh, with us this afternoon. Have a good day, everyone.